and Michael Remus. What's going on, everybody? Let's do this. A uh, big, huge, massive edition of Winnipeg Sports Daily is live. Great to have you all with us. And uh, this one's packed. Um, we've got a big hockey game to discuss last night. A disappointing loss for the Winnipeg Jets. Against the Florida Panthers, one of the teams that has really become the class of the National Hockey League, and they showed it last night, but uh, continued struggles for the Winnipeg Jets and now in a real, real tough predicament in the Central Division, approaching the midway point of the season. Now, we're going to talk a lot about it today. Steve Coolius will join us from Sirius XM NHL Radio. He is uh, he's fired up, and he, like many of you Jet fans, not pleased with the current plight of the local hockey side. And we'll also dive into uh, more of what are the issues with the Winnipeg Jets and look ahead to the next three games before the All-Star break with the one and only Marat Atesh of The Athletic. We'll also check in with the Manitoba Moose before the end of the program. Defenseman Nelson Noje, longtime member of the club and the organization, is going to jump on the program. And coming up after Cooley and Marat, we will be joined by... And this has to be the biggest guest in Winnipeg sports talk history as we approach a few weeks away from our first anniversary. Um, arguably the greatest football player ever. Um, the NFL record in receptions, touchdowns, yardage. Jerry Rice joining us to uh, now look back at the incredible playoff weekend and uh, discuss his 49ers as they take on the Rams with an opportunity to get back to the Super Bowl. And of course, the AFC Championship game with the Kansas City Chiefs and the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, of course, Jerry's gonna Jerry's got a great commercial that is going to be airing during the Super Bowl as well with our friends at DraftKings. We'll see some of that. Um, so Jerry Rice, Nelson Noje, Murata Tesh, Steve Cooley is coming up. Uh, but all in all, it is going to be a uh, a pack pack show. I know it's a busy day. People want us to talk about a lot of things. We're going to be talking Jets. We're going to be talking football. We're going to be talking about the things that we like to talk about here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. So without further ado, let's get Michael Remus in here to get the festivities going. Remo, how are you, my friend? You know, considering the uh, disappointing end to the Jets game, and I kept... You know, they were down a goal in the third, and I was like, they're kind of putting pressure on. I'm going to live I'm gonna live bet them. I don't usually live uh, bet on, uh, on on cool bet, but um, I was like, yeah, I got, I'm optimistic, but I uh, couldn't quite puff the win, fall short just again. Another disappointing loss was a five in a row now, uh, two points in their la- out of the last ten, possibly disappointing. But however, I know we've got a great show, Jerry Rice coming up, so uh, my excitement, like, uh, I'm like shaking. Uh, thinking about him uh, coming on the show. So it's actually incredible. One of the greatest of all time. I used to say Randy Moss was the best, but uh, now I'm a Jerry Rice guy. (laughs) Well, I'll (laughs) tell you what, you're not going to want to miss it, folks. Uh, That's coming up in hour two of the program. A big shout out to the sponsors that make Winnipeg Sports Talk happen. We cannot thank you enough, especially on a day like today, thinking about what the last year has been like. We would not be here. We would not be doing it without folks like Culligan Water, Vita Health Fresh Market, F Apparel, Not Auto Corp, Royal Sports, Manitoba Battery, Boston Pizza, the Nick and Nicky DQ group who were with us before we even did a single show, Princess Auto, Little Brown Jug, Canadian Club Whiskey, and of course our friends over at Cool Bet Canada. Um, Remo, let's just dive into this right now. A 5-3 loss last night to the Florida Panthers. And um Listen, there were some real great things. I mean, Cole Perfetti showed, I mean, just brilliant offensive instincts last night with a couple of world-class assists. Um, 
But man, there were breakdowns there. I mean, we really saw the difference between the Winnipeg Jets and where they're at right now with a true Stanley Cup contender. And, uh, you know, there was uh, some long faces after the game. I mean, there was only 250 long faces in the stands, including the guy. You did call your shot. There was a guy in a Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh costume yesterday. That was mm-hmm. uh, that was nice work. Nice insider fan yeah, insider was, information I, I that you broke, dropped on the program yesterday. I broke the news on this show that there would be a guy in, Winnip- in the Winnie the Pooh costume on TV. Hashtag insider. <laughs> <laughs> that was some great insider news. But, um... I mean, that's a, that's a gut punch for a team that actually was able to generate some offense. We saw, I mean, just an absolutely filthy goal by uh, Kyle Connor. Um, you know, the setup from Cole Perfetti um, to Pierre-Luc Dubois. But again, they were chasing the game. They got back down, you know, some unfortunate defensive miscues. Um, and then, as we'll talk with Cooley coming up in the, in the first Jets segment, um, you know, just some breakdowns. And the one thing that just, I mean, and I know they talked about it on the broadcast last night. I thought Kevin Sawyer did a good job of describing what what was happening. The Florida Panthers were gaining the zone and the center of the ice, the slot for high danger scoring chances with at times almost no resistance from the Winnipeg Jets. I mean, that looked like a team that knew exactly what they were doing. They were playing together. They were using a system. And the Jets at times looked, um, you know, completely discombobulated, especially in their own end. And, Listen, I'm willing to grant the fact that, like, Billy Hanela came in. He had a rough name. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Don't Let's not judge a player on one game. It was a tough situation coming in for Morrissey, finding out probably an hour, an hour and a half before the game that he was playing. Um, and But in a situation like that, the entire need, team needs to sort of step up. And, and first things first, focus on the defensive part of the game. And... At times, it hasn't been fair to the defenseman either. Certainly hasn't been fair to Connor Hellebuck. And then Hellebuck, I mean, I don't know. Our our guy Mitch was tweeting out last night. I mean, yes, of course, there were more shock caller references on Twitter last night. But in addition, I mean, some of the some of the ridiculous bounces that come off of Connor Hellebuck playing the puck. I mean, you just can't even write this stuff up. I mean, uh, the one where he was clearing it off the stanchion and it hit. I want to say it was either Dylan Sandberg's stick or the Florida Panther player's stick. Got it right out to the Panther guy, into the slot, boom, in in the net. I mean, you just sort of look to the stars. I mean, things are, things are difficult right now for the Winnipeg Jets. And, you know, we're just looking. Ken Weeb's down to practice today. And we'll talk about this with Murad a little later on, saying a very quiet practice today. Not a lot of uh, joy in Joyland, to quote our old friend uh, Claude Noel. Um, but this is a serious predicament for the Winnipeg Jets. And we'll go over this with Coolius. But, I mean, the Jets are two games above NHL 500 right now. Dallas is in fifth place in the Central Division. They're six up. And you've got four teams that are 13, 15, 21 games above. I mean, the thought of even getting in and challenging in that second half of the season for a top three spot in the Central Division, I mean, honestly, by the numbers, almost looks impossible right now. But, I mean, if this team doesn't start stacking up some points and getting on a run in the right direction, um, you know, the, the conversations we could be having at the end of February might be very different than I think the ones that everyone expected to be when this team came to training camp, pushing the salary cap in LTIR for most of the year. Um, And really you look back at these last five games against good teams um, and the jets simply have not been able to, uh, you know, to meet the challenges of, you know, some real contending teams. And we saw it last night in spades at Canada life center in front of two fifty. Yeah, thank you, uh, Larry Eloy, uh, for the super chat there, by the way. We, we'll get into the topic you want us to discuss at some point, but back to the Jets game. I think the biggest positive you can take from that game, I mean, the play of Cole Perfetti, you know, we have been talked about, Huss. Um, the nine games, would he get over nine and, you know, start up that ELC? And I think there's absolutely no debate about it. Uh, I mean, he's going to play again. He's on the team. He's making an impact. And, I mean, the pass, I mean, he had a pretty nice pass on the Connor goal, but um, the uh, the other one, the one that he set up to Pierre-Luc Dubois, uh, what an incredible move, past a diving uh, defenseman, um, you know, taking around him, setting up Dubois. I mean, he's been fantastic, but sadly, I mean, that was, we, we talked early in the game, you know, we need the more line score, well, the third line got in there, Paul Stasny getting on the action from Lowry, and Lowry almost had another one actually late on a beautiful oh. pass from, from Stasny. 
But that pass, um, yeah. just quickly, that pass was, I mean, almost impossible. I, I still can't believe he was able to airmail two defensemen to get it on Lowry's stick. Mm. And sort of the story of Adam Lowry's year. I mean, a great chance, a great move. It does everything, including beat the goalie, gets the puck through, and it didn't go into the net. And unfortunately, that's just the way it seems like it's going right now for the Winnipeg Jets. Close, but not good enough. And that, in a lot of ways, it sort of emulated the uh, the bigger story of last night's game. But it was much more than missing a couple chances. The Florida Panthers, um, you know, they could have had a ton more <laughs> goals, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, Hunter Hellebuck made some big saves, and he had to. Um, because the Jets just seemed so, um, you know how they always used to use the use of the word like the team needs to be connected. That was like their their catchphrase. I'm not sure whether they still use that. They didn't look very connected last night, and uh, especially when it really counted. And that's when the Florida Panthers had the puck. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, um, they, I mean, it was a tough one. Uh, I mean, it wasn't. We talked about depth scoring. Mason Marchman out of nowhere has wasn't you know <laughs> leading scorer Jonathan Huberto who was. You know, held uh, pointless in the game, but Mason Marchment with two and an assist, you know, could have had a couple more. Uh, what a performance are those guys in this. Anton Lundell, a rookie, having a great season as well. He had two points yesterday. Um, you know, the Jets could, tried to get in a, into a bit of a track meet there with a Florida team that has put up, you know, five on other teams repeatedly. But I think if you're a Jets fan, you got to get concerned as their spot in the standing. And, and I know they have games in hand, but just from points percentage, I mean, they're below... Every they're sixth in the by points percentage, they're sixth in the Western. It's not going to change anything, so they're going to have to figure a way to get more points. And I mean, how do you do that with the way with the same with the same guys? They, you know, we've kind of heard the same thing: stick to our game, play more defense. We've heard that the last uh, the last couple seasons. So I, you know, seeing a lot of people in chat maybe feeling like, okay, maybe we'll have to be or the team's going to have to be sellers uh, at the trade deadline instead of buyers. And that's a position that I didn't think. The team would be in um, coming in when we raised the banner of off-season champions here <laughs> on the channel. Gonna have to put that on if they miss the playoffs. Gonna have to put that on old takes exposed. Oh, no doubt, no doubt about it. But you're exactly right. I mean, the expectations were high for this hockey club. They still are for this hockey club. Certainly within the organization, even if some fans are sort of now already into next year's season, um, and they should be. I mean, they're spending to the cap right now. There's a lot of incredibly talented players. Good young guys. I mean, the young guys, especially Cole Perfetti, I mean, was one of the stars of the game last night with what he was able to do. But, um, you know, this is a team game. It's not just a bunch of individuals doing it themselves. And, you know, the Florida Panthers were uh, an incredibly cohesive team last night that played together uh, to their strengths. And the Jets, in a lot of times, in a lot of cases, just didn't have, you know, a lot of answers. I mean, offensively, I thought they did some good things. I mean, they got a lot of shots on Bobrovsky. They had some had some legitimately quality opportunities, some that were saved. Um, they did generate some goals. Power play looked pretty good. But none of that matters if you're giving up five in your own net. And, um, you know, I, Rimo, if you can, get the Paul Stastny clip up yeah, afterwards. Yeah, it's good to go. Because... You know, we remember last season, Stastny, when things were going very poorly at the end of the season, it seemed like things were kind of cratering in on the Winnipeg Jets. That was the time that Paul Stastny went to the microphone. And I don't want to say he called out his team, but he he absolutely pointed out the, the real hard truths about what was happening and what wasn't happening with the Winnipeg Jets. And this is the guy that's been on a lot of really good teams. Uh, and I think he truly believes that this team has the potential inside that dressing room to be a really good team. But it wasn't playing there. It wasn't playing that way. And we talked a lot about that speech of what Paul Stastny had said publicly that I think everyone needed to know. And it was interesting. Uh, and I think probably a very good choice by the Jets PR staff um, to put Stastny out yesterday with Cole Perfetti. I mean, people wanted to, you know, hear from per Cole about, you know, his game and um, but I mean, he's not going to be a person coming in after nine games in the National Hockey League, breaking down the issues with the Winnipeg Jets. Paul Stastny is a guy that, you know, has that stroke in the room and has the ability to maybe say some hard truths that people really did need, need to hear. So here's just a little bit of how Paul Stastny opened up last night's post-game media presser. Uh, frustrated. Um... 
just inconsistent play. I think it's like, uh, you know, there's parts that are good, there's parts that are bad, and then we just, it seems like we shoot ourselves in the foot and get away from the game a little bit. Almost that's where we're just trying to play for offense too much, you know, and then leave our D-men on island or leave our goaltending on island. And obviously, you love five goals. You're, I mean, you might win once or twice this year, but you shouldn't expect that. I mean, you score three goals, you should find a way to win, and that, that should be our mindset. And um, it's tough right now. I think, uh, you know, guys are frustrated. You got, you know, some injuries, missing some guys. But, you know, everyone went through this. And then for us, we got to find a way to kind of turn it around here for the all-star break. Uh, so there was just a little bit of Paul Stastny from yesterday. I mean, he, he talked about a number of things. I mean, the, the, the obvious things about what they need to get back to focusing on as a team, um, and that is defense first. And, you know, he kind of rolled out the best teams that he's been on are the ones that, you know, focus on doing those things and keeping the puck out of their net and everything comes out from that. And, you know, I mean, the Jets had not done a very good job of scoring at five on five, certainly over the course of this road trip. And I think many people thought that maybe there was a little too much effort and exertion in trying to keep up with the Panthers offensively and forgetting many of the things that you need to do to be successful, especially against a team like, like Florida. And listen, I'm not going to overlook the fact that Josh Morrissey was out. Philly Hanela came in right before the game. It was a real tough situation for him to be in. I mean, he was playing with Nate Beaulieu. Um, let's just say I don't expect we'll see that pairing at any point in the future. Although, geez, I've been wrong on a lot of other things so far this year. Um, people should not. There's, there's been a lot of talk about Philly Hanel, and I've been one that's been wanting to see him, much like you know many of you. Um, I think it's you know if he had a world class game. I think it's important not to all of a sudden anoint him as, uh, you know, a guy that's going to be rattling, you know, needing a new cabinet for all of his Norris trophies. And by the same time, with the way things started last yesterday in that game, um, you know, it's important not to say, well, what's all this talk about? The guy's no good. I mean, listen, he, he had a rough time. thought he got better as the game went on. And Dave Lowry, to his credit, um, you know, certainly made a point of saying this wasn't about any one player. And Billy really was in a, situa a tough situation going into the game that night. Um, you know, you're without three of your regular defensemen. Uh, you know, there there was a lot of things that were up against it, but unfortunately, that's the way the NHL is this year. There's injuries, there's the COVID list, there's a schedule that's going to get a hell of a lot more tough when we get into February with all these makeup games. Um, so you got to live with it and you got to deal with it. And so far, the Winnipeg's just just haven't been dealing with it well enough. And uh, um, tell you what, Reem, these next three games, um, you know, of course, we saw you know, Vancouver and Edmonton. Edmonton comes back into the game. It's 2-2, and all of a sudden, they basically just shut it down for the final four minutes to get to overtime and get that point. I mean, everyone's getting points right now. The Jets have two of a possible 10 in their last five games. Um, so they've got Vancouver tomorrow night. I would say that's as close to a must win at this point in the season as you'll have. Huge game in St. Louis on Saturday afternoon. And then you got the Philadelphia Flyers, who have been struggling uh, worse than almost any team in the National Hockey League. Oh, it is a dozen in a row now in the loss column. Um, so three games to get some points, to get a little bit of a positive momentum, and to get ready for uh, a month of February, Remo, where I don't think it's an overstatement at all to say this season is on the line. Because if they don't have, and I'm not talking about, you know, just keeping your head above water in and around 500. I mean, if they don't have a considerable more amount of wins than regulation losses in the month of February, those conversations that we didn't think we'd be having in March about the trade deadline from a seller's perspective is unfortunately going to be a reality for the Jets and their general manager, Kevin Sheveldale. Yeah, just a quick look ahead um, before we get to our uh, Coolius coming up. Uh, I mean, you got Flyers, Wild. I mean, all these division games, Wild, Dallas, Nashville. I mean, you can make up some ground on those teams. Minnesota, again. But, I mean, having the games that you can make up ground is great, but you got to go in and win them. And... I mean, when the Jets have played some of these top teams, has, they've given up a lot of goals. Colorado, was that a touchdown? Minnesota, that, that was a lot. Nashville last week, it just hasn't gone well. And then five again. And I mean, I know Hellbuck is a great goalie, but he can't do it by himself. Definitely needs uh, help as, uh, as well. I agree, you know, some of the, they're definitely short on D, you know, losing Morrissey like an hour before the game. I was scrambling to, uh, you know, check my DraftKings lineups. I showed it to Nate Schmidt, who took advantage of the increased ice time uh, ice time yesterday. That was that was a bonus for me. But um, I think it's going to be real tough uh, next week. And I see a lot of people in chat feeling, you know, more down uh, than I think you were at the beginning of the season. Because at least you had a lot of runway. 
Uh, not not as much at this point of year. Well, I mean, let's go back to two a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we knew that, you know, the schedule was light, but this team was going to be going up in, you know, on a road trip where they were playing four really good teams. And and Rob Somerville, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. That's literally exactly what I said. Everyone in this league is going through this. I mean, missing a player here or there or bringing in some guys because they're on the COVID list. You got to deal with it. That's exactly what every team has had to go through right now. And um, and no one's feeling sorry for the Winnipeg Jets or any other team that's in that situation. You need to take advantage of it. But anyways, back to the point about the four-game road trip. I mean, yeah, you're going out and you're playing some really good teams, and it's four and six. I will say this. We haven't heard one excuse about the schedule or the travel or anything like that, and I, and I do appreciate that because that was something I think that drove a lot of people crazy over the last number of years. Um, but I don't know how many times we have to say this is a results-based business, and you know, to come out of that road trip with only two points was, I mean, it could be devastating for this season. Um, and then a game like last night where, you know, you got Florida at the end of their road trip, uh, you know, that, that was a game that, you know, was, was winnable. Um, but again, when you, you play the way that they did in their own end, especially, and give up the amount of ice to an elite team like the Florida Panthers, I mean, it's no way to win a hockey game. And, uh, you know, if things don't improve, as I said, we're going to be having, you know, conversations, I think, on this program that, um, you know, we weren't expecting to have. Now, I will say this. I think it's way too early. I know a lot of people are already there. I'm not there to start throwing in the towel on the season. But um, I will echo what Hellebuck said after the road trip. I mean, there has to be a sense of urgency uh, playing for your playoff lives because as crazy as it sounds, at the end of January, that's exactly where the Winnipeg Jets are. And we're going to get to that coming up in just a second with Steve Coolius and Murata Tesh. Um, before we do that, a, a big shout out to our friends over at Culligan Water, uh, the water leaders here in Winnipeg for 65 years in business. Whether you're needing water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, drinking water systems for your home or office, or, and citywide water delivery services, Culligan have been the experts with the best water products for six plus decades here in the city of winnipeg and if you need something for your office or business they've got plenty of commercial and industrial water products and solutions as well uh you can find them at 1200 sergeant avenue or give them a call at 204-694-5180 our friends over at drinkculligan.com uh vita health fresh market big event on friday it is customer appreciation day uh if you've heard us talking about vita health fresh market maybe looking at some of those great non-alcoholic products they've got, all their incredible vitamins and supplements that are available, not to mention the incredible selection of vegan products or maybe just going to go in and try some of their great grab-and-go items, including salads and sandwiches. It would be a heck of a great time to go in just to put everything in the store, 10% off for their special customer appreciation day, which is coming up on Friday, December 28th. That's going to be available at all seven vital locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge. And you can uh, also find out more on everything that Vita Health has waiting for you at Vita, myvita. .ca. And of course, we're going to keep looking good in 2022. Thanks to our friends over at F Apparel. Custom suits for men. Andrew and Alex, a Winnipeg-owned company that started right here. Crank it out. The city's best full line of custom clothing, including suits, dress shirts, winter jackets, chinos, golf pants, untucked dress shirts, and more. Not to mention ties and accessories. Every guy needs at least one suit that fits and looks great. And F's custom-made suits start at just $400. And if you got a wedding coming up this summer... Your wedding party will get 15% off if you get your suits from F and you will never look that good. F Apparel, 190 Smith Street downtown or make an appointment or find out more at F. That's EPHapparel.com. All right, Marat's coming up a little later on. The GOAT, Jerry Rice, joining us on Winnipeg Sports Talk later on in hour two of the program. But let's st start things off by breaking down what is going on with the Winnipeg Jets with Steve Coolius from Sirius XM NHL Radio. What's going on, Steve? Thanks so much for joining us here in the peg. Hey, I love being in the peg. I love your background. Living large, I see. <laughs> well, well, well. The buyout check worked out well, Andrew. It's great to be back. I'm not happy with the Jets, but thanks for the shout-out and the plug. 
Uh, it's fun to be back. Well, you know what? Uh, it, it, it's fun to be back. It's fun to be talking about all this stuff, except sometimes when we're talking about the home team. And uh, man, cool. Um, you know, they got through the, all the delays, you know, without any extended losing streak. But man, only two points of a possible eight on this last road trip. A home loss to a very, very good Florida Panthers team. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a serious predicament the Winnipeg Jets have found themselves in in the standings right now as we approach the midway point of the season. Yeah, they're not in the Pacific, Andrew, where, you know, you can be crappy and come out of it. You're, you're in the Central. You know, third in the division, you guarantee a ticket. They give you a ticket. Fourth, then you're playing the wild card game. Fifth, you better hope nobody from the Pacific is good enough. Sixth, bye-bye, bye-bye. You know, it's it's not going to happen. And last night, go watch the 4-3 winning goal. I know you did. Carter Verhage. I saw fly-by. I saw fly-by. I saw wannabe defense. I saw, you know... Second to the puck in hockey is loser hockey. And it made, made me think of Paul Maurice maybe when he thought, I just I can't get these guys to play like I want. They need another voice. It's not working. They're just good enough to finish second every night. I was pissed off about the game in Pittsburgh. I was pissed off about the game in Boston. And I was pissed off last night. They've left points on the table. And you know what teams do when leave points on the table? They lose and they miss the playoffs. And that's where they're headed right now. They're plus two NHL 500 you got to be kidding me. I'm not happy. I'm not happy. Well, you know what? I think uh, many people in the Winnipeg Sports Talk chat room are uh, giving you major dap right now because um, that seems to be the predicament that um, you know many people find themselves in. And you mentioned that plus two NHL 500. Here's the central division right now. Avs are plus 21. The Predators are plus 13. Blues are plus 13. The Wild are plus 15. And now the Dallas Stars are plus six. Steve, and we talk about, oh, there's a lot of hockey left to be played. There's not a lot of time for the Winnipeg Jets to get back on a run, or we could be going into March and the trade deadline in a situation that I think most Jets fans and certainly Jets management thought was not a possibility when they put together the squad at the cap that started the season in game number one. I know, Andrew, can you imagine if they're sellers? Like, can, can you imagine? And if you are a seller... You got to sell because that helps you next year. Like, you can't say, no, I refuse to sell. I refuse to sell. Well, people have asked about uh, defensemen and forward deck. No, you, you got to do it. And it, it's frustrating because if the talent honestly wasn't there, if they didn't have the goaltending, if they didn't have Cole Perfetti coming in and playing great with those beautiful assists, and if they didn't have some depth, yeah, I'm not happy with the Nick Ehlers play, but it's over. You know, it's over. Get, you know, fans in the stands, that issue, it, we, we can't do about it. So either we pile up the excuses or we try to win. And, you know, they're not catching the big three or four. They got to finish fifth and hope that's, you know, a wild card spot. That, that's really what it comes down to. They better be better than Dallas. And, and, and let's see what ends up happening. It's plus two. A new season starts this week at plus two. And that's it. And from here on in, you know what plus two is? It's 84 points. Plus 15 is 97. 97 is probably going to get you in at each conference. So you're plus two. You got a lot of work to do, Susie, to get there in the second half of the year. And you can't hit a grand slam in your next game. And I know the cliches, but this literally is about picking up points and looking at stretches of, uh, you know, seven, two, and one, and six, and four, and five, four, and one, and plus, and adding. If you're playing mediocre and losing hockey, forget it. And the thing is, they can score, but they're just good enough, just good enough to lose these one and two goal games. And it's frustrating. I'll tell you right now. And hey, look. I watch the Canadian teams play first. It's what we do. The Americans don't want to hear me say that on the show and everything else. I prefer Dennis Bayak over blank. It's just the way it is. I love the boys. It's frustrating, man. I, 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 I'm, I'm angry because it's like in life. You got a kid that's got C plus when they could be a you know B plus, A minus. Then you're angry. If the best you can do is C plus, that's okay, Johnny. It's all right. They're way better than this. They're, they're, they're disappointing. Like this is... This is a gut shot, which by leaving points on the table right now. Honestly. Well, and, and you know what I mean? It's happened over the past week. And I mean, it really, and this may have been part of the frustration that led to Paul Maurice leaving the hockey club. But I mean, you think back to Carl Vemelka coming in and, you know, you know, a one nothing game. And we talk about that Arizona game and the Buffalo game, which ended up being Paul Maurice's last game. But I mean, Steve, right now, and you kind of laid it out, um, you know, without three point victories in regulation, um, you know, it's difficult to make up a lot of ground. And then you look like 
you know, look at the Edmonton Vancouver game last night, like with four minutes left in that game, did it not seem like there was somewhat of a gentleman's agreement to let's just each get our point and then let's get another one for whoever's lucky enough to win an overtime or a shootout. And at least you don't have that dreaded regulation loss. It's the regulation losses that kill you. And the Winnipeg Jets have had way too many of those, especially as of late. Yeah. You know, I go back to the Vegas game. That was my game of the year. Two, nothing two goal. Yeah. You know, at least they won it. Like they came back and they pulled. So they have it in them. Like that's the thing is they have them have it in them. The Oilers were dead in the water. They were dead in the water. Spencer Martin is, you know, found money for Vancouver, it seems. Terrible goal by Ryan McLeod. Oilers had life. They came back. Then they had the, the freeze, like card sharks. Higher, lower than a two. Higher, higher, lower than a jack. Lower. Oh, an eight. Freeze for the final three minutes. And then the Oilers blitzkrieg in the overtime. They were going to win on our guarantee of the night on the show. I said, McDavid finally breaks the the bubble and scores and he did in overtime like they willed themselves to victory right they willed themselves to victory and i know they got great players but so do the jets i'd like to see the jets will themselves to victory in games that maybe they shouldn't even get a point that's what happened last night the Oilers may have saved their season beating the flames they trailed two nothing in that game trailed vancouver and they've now added four points and two games above 500 as they try to chase down the california teams I think the Oilers are going to finish third. Calgary's going to finish second. I really do. But it's a game like last night that they willed themselves to victory. I need to see that from the boys at Portage and Maine. Like, I need to see that starting this week, Andrew. Well, you know, Steve, um, Pierre-Luc Dubois has had a great bounce-back season. Kyle Connors turned into one of the you know most prolific scorers in the league and is heading to the All-Star game. They're playing with Cole Perfetti last night, and he was one of the real bright spots. I mean, as disappointing as the loss was for Jet fans, um, the glimpses of brilliance from Perfetti, I think, have people really excited. you got a defense core that certainly on paper was a hell of a lot better than last year. You've got a great goaltender in Connor Hellebuck. I've got to ask you, what's missing from this team, and why are they in the spot that they're in? I believe what honestly is missing is in the pursuits of scoring, they give up some of those Barry Trotz type situations defensively. And go look at the 4 3 goal again, Andrew. I know you've seen it umpteen times. <laughs> Seven or eight small mistakes that lead to the goal. You know, not taking a stick in front, a couple of flybys to score the 4 3 goal, um, not blocking a shot. There's a lot of that. And it's not just this year. I can go back to 2019 and say the 2018 2019 season. That season, 20, 21, 22. So for four years, it's not broken. It needs fixing of saying it's 3-3. We want to score the next one, but we don't need to score it on this play in our own zone where I can name the names and give you the numbers on the flybys and the non-blocked and the non-covering in front. It just happens too often. And they want to score more than they want to win. And they got to defend better. They got to defend better too much in high danger. They got to help Connor more. Okay. As good as he is, he's not Hashik where you can say, hey, you know, this is the 99 Sabres. They got to be better defensively first. I really believe that. I really believe that that is more of their downfall of cheating to score than playing Barry Trotz defensive hockey first. That's what I see. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. That's what I see first. Well, we certainly saw it last night. And, you know, granted, you know, losing Josh Morrissey right before the game didn't help. Um, Dylan DeMello and Logan Stanley were out. But, I mean, that's happening to every team this year. I mean, you, you really can't use that as an excuse because, um, you know, it's no different than every other team in the National Hockey League, Steve. But that game in particular, the ease with which the Florida Panthers got the puck into the jet zone, into the center areas, into high danger areas, Without a lot, I, I, I mean, you would think that if there was ever a game where the full forwards would be completely locked in on helping out the guys on the back end, especially a number of young players that hadn't been there, that would have been it. And frankly, it was one of the worst games of the entire season for the Winnipeg Jets when it came to team defense and doing those things to at least make it difficult for your opponent to create offense and high danger chances. One of the great lines about the Jets is... No lead is insurmountable, um, but no lead is safe. And, and that's how they play. They're still one of the most exciting teams in the NHL, which is really, really good and really, really bad. And, and that's what it is. And I can we can talk about the Vegas game, the Pittsburgh game, the Boston game, and the Florida game. They give up the blue line too easily. Like, they do. And when you allow this many rush chances, you're fun to play against. 
And then teams keep coming with speed, and then they love it. And yeah, they don't score in every opportunity, but there's too much in front of Hellebuck. Like I, and he's going to play the most games in the league this year. What is he, Grand Fier of 1996? Like he's going to play because they need him. And instead of resting him in February, they're going to play him again and again and again, and he's going to get tired. And I've seen goalies this year get tired that they need a break. And and it, and it caught up to them. It caught up to Shesterkin, and then he had to miss games because of health reasons. And and then it helped him when he got back. Um, I look at Toronto and what's going on now. The, they need Mrazic to play more games, and it, I think it's going to benefit the starter tonight, uh, Campbell, when it comes down to it. And Hellebuck's playing too much, so it is now a recipe for disaster of chasing your tail. They chase the game the whole down one nothing, they tie it. That's great. Down two one, they tie. Like I love all that stuff, and that all that was all great. But when you keep chasing, the energy to chase is more than the energy. You're you're going downhill. When you're a good downhill, when you have the lead, they're chasing you. So you can do some coasting and conserve energy. Do we have a play here? No, we're up 4-3. Get center, get it out, get off. But when you're losing, you're always chasing, and it takes way more energy. It's taxing. Look at the February schedule. I, I, I don't want to sound defeatist. Show me, Missouri. Show me, Jets, that you can have a great February, March, and April uh, to get to the 95, 97 points range. They got the talent. They got the skill. Do they have the will to play defensively, Andrew? That's my million-dollar question. Well, hell, never cool. I mean, never mind February. I mean, yeah, listen, I, I would say that these next three games, Vancouver, afternoon game and, and Saturday against St. Louis, and then, you know, a game against the Philadelphia Flyers who have incredibly turned into almost the, the free space on the bingo card in the National Hockey League. But you still got to play those games. I mean, if they can't get five, six points, um, I mean, we could be talking about a, a lead right now that is... Uh, I don't want to say insurmountable, but um, it would take a lot of things and a lot of things outside of their control to make it happen. Let's focus on something that has been a real positive, and that's Cole Perfetti. Uh, man, a couple passes last night. Uh, you know what? You want to talk a silver lining? 91's performance last night and so far has been that. Um, how exciting, how excited should Jet fans be about the potential of uh, their first rounder who's uh, about to play his 10th game in the league? I am obviously very excited. You never know what someone can be. We've seen first round stars, first round flops, first round not there yet. I mean, I was happy on a side note for Nolan Patrick last night. He scored a beautiful goal between his legs and then a backhand. It's still going to take time. Uh, if he's healthy up here, he can play. And, 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 and I'm using that as an example because you mentioned Philly. God forbid if the Jets play Philly and they still haven't won yet. I don't want to be. Jets and play Philly if they're 0 12. And you know what I mean? Now you're playing the law of averages and it's the Jets who give up the home. Oh, I, I don't want to be that. But anyway, so if you look at this window, Cole Perfetti, I don't want to name drop because James Neal's still my neighbor. I hope his career isn't over. We're in New and Dyke Roberts country here uh, in Whitby in the Primos. Uh, Cole Perfetti's been in the backyard. He's an 02. I got an 02 as well. They've had some parties. Great kid. Thanks for having me. One of those guys. So of course you cheer for him. Um, cause you know, we're in a hockey hotbed here as you guys are there and I just want him to succeed. And the one thing is when you can put the puck on sticks of veteran players like that and Connor, uh, and Pierre-Luc Dubois, and they can point to you and say, well done kid, you're going to play. And we know the real truth is you can't fool the players. Like they know, and you want them to be top six, you know, Oh, you bring them in. You put him on the fourth line. He's on the third line. No, you're on the third line. If you're the Colorado Avalanche and you're stacked and you're scoring four goals a game, or maybe you're Florida, but right now on the Jets, you want him to be a top six, and he's proving that he can be a top six. Now I'm not saying he's the next team with Delaney. I'm not saying he's the next Keith Kachuk. He doesn't play that way anyway. I'm saying if he can just at least be kind of a 25 to 30 goals, 35, 40 assists in that category, that's great. That's good, and every everything else is bonus. Good kid. He cares. He's got skill, and he'll get better. When you give the guy a chance and he sprinkles stuff in, you know, you don't want to soak the steak in too much steak sauce. You want to have enough on it that you like and you cut into a beautiful medium rare and it's tasty and his play is tasty and he served up two tasty dishes last night. Uh, Steve Cooley is a serious XM NHL radio and the cool button podcast with us on Winnipeg sports talk. Hey, just while we're at it, I know a lot of people here in Winnipeg hadn't had the opportunity to see much of the Florida Panthers so far this season. They came as advertised last night. I mean, uh, how impressed have you been with Florida? And uh, when you look at the top teams in the National Hockey League, I mean, how serious a Stanley Cup contender do you think the Panthers are this season? 
I had to still be sold because I thought, well, let's see what Tampa's like when they're healthy. But Tampa was still better when they weren't healthy. Like that, that that's the truth is even with people out, they just won, baby. Don't have a third line. They made up a new one. Corey Perry retired. No, he might score 20. You know, like all the things you're going, are you kidding me? They have four defense. Let's see how they do with four defense. They all play. Speaking of foot, I forgot about Adam foot. Cal foot plays 25 minutes. Hedman plays 33. Four defense. What is this? Beer league in the Oshawa beer league? You got to be kidding me. And then, so Tampa does their thing. We got four good teams in the Metro. I don't know who I believe in more, probably Carolina and then Florida. If I had to really pare it down, like really cut the meat to the tender cut, Tampa, Carolina, Vegas, Colorado, and Florida of the elite, elite, elite top five. And Florida would be there. I didn't think before. And Bobrovsky's been hats off. Hats off. Net, net. That's what he says around the net. Net, net, making big saves. So Florida's in there. The Fab Five, the Panthers, they can score when they want. And they wanted to a lot last night. They score four and five at will. And the proof is in the pudding. Uh, Steve Cooley is with us. Steve, uh, let's hope that we can hit you up and maybe connect towards the end of February and we can look back at this conversation and laugh about how freaked out everyone was about the Jets because they've just turned it around and got it going. That's the optimistic side of me. That being said, would love to talk to you again. Fill people in before we go on uh, what you and Craig Button have going on on the hockey pod. Uh, that's right. Cool Button Pod. Craig and I are back. Uh, he's going to tell us about the art of the trade. He's going to take us to and through trade deadlines of the past and how it's honestly done. Like, we've never been there. You know, I want this guy. I want to give up this. So I love it. Craig's got some great stories. Uh, we talk about, of course, current events, but we always tie in, like, a Mark Giordano trade. What was it like when you traded for Chris Drury? What's it like to make a trade? Things that hockey fans are like, oh, my God, I didn't know that. Take me in the room. He's so good at that. We have a lot of fun. I know people want us to drop F-bombs and everything else, or they want to help you, you know, the 30-year-old uh, understand what it's like on the beach. That's not our MO, okay? If you want that, you've got curfew and chiclets. We're more of a serious, hardcore talk of some storytelling and everything else. So uh, uh, we're part of the regime now. Listen in. Don't forget us on Satellite Radio as well. Andrew, I'm always happy to come on with you, my friend. Well, this is great, folks. Wherever you're uh, picking up the Winnipeg Sports Talk pod, search Cool Button and uh, get the latest from uh, Steve and Craig. And, of course, check out uh, him on the Power Play weekdays on Sirius XM NHL Radio. Steve, this was awesome. I love your energy. And uh, let's hope we can inject some of that into the hockey team for the next month because it's go time for the Winnipeg Jets. Absolutely. If you get a chance or pass it along, tell Cole, we're proud of you in Whitby, Ontario. Oh my God, that was amazing. Cooley, um, I, I joked to him off air that, uh, that, you know, I'm usually pretty high energy, but I feel like a flatliner around you, Cooley. Hey, if you enjoyed it and you're with us on YouTube, do us a favor, hit that thumbs up button. And uh, if you are listening to the podcast, tell a friend, let's help us spread the word of uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk and what we're doing every day. Make sure you hit that subscribe button too. For all you folks checking out the program, on YouTube. Much more to come. Jerry Rice still to come. We'll check in with the Moose and Nelson Noje later on in the program and Murata Tesh in just a couple of minutes. Well, you know, Cooley came in sort of like some uh, uh, booster cables for this program and certainly for the chat. Um, he, uh, When we talk about batteries, the, there's nobody that has a battery like Steve Coolius except for maybe our friends over at Manitoba Battery who are powering the city of Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba all through this brutal Winnipeg winter. Um, when it comes to batteries for your car, for your truck, for any sort of vehicle, uh, don't waste your time at the big box stores, support local and get the best price on a battery over at Manitoba Battery at 1026 Logan Avenue. They've got it all starting with 9450 with Core Exchange. Uh, and an just amazing staff that'll help you get everything you need when you pop down a Manitoba battery up. If you're a sledder, we've got a lot of snow. I don't think I need to tell anybody that. Um, about $65 to $75. You pretty much can get any any snow machine uh, on the trails, if you will. Um, but again, right now, keeping your car running and warm is priority number one. And Manitoba Battery will do that for you. Find them online at manitobabattery.com or give them a call at 
87 87. Well, Jerry Rice is coming up in a few minutes on the program. Uh, we know what he'll be wearing on Sunday. Yeah, it'll be the red of the San Francisco 49ers is uh, the team where he spent the most time of his NFL Hall of Fame career. Um, if you want to get a Jerry Rice or maybe a Jimmy G or maybe a Patrick Mahomes, you can get ready for NFL Championship Sunday over at Royal Sports with the best selection of NFL merchandise in town, not to mention all that great bomber merch and championship gear from the 2021 Grey Cup champs and thousands and thousands of exclusive Winnipeg Jets items available over at Royal Sports as well. And while you're there, check out their million dollars of hockey inventory, the uh, incredible snowboard section, not to mention all the cool stuff on the other side of the snow store over at King's Skate Snow and Search. Follow them on Instagram at Royal Sports Pamina for the latest merchandise drops, as well as great deals, as well as King's underscore SSS for everything happening over on the King's side. Royal Sports, 750 Pamina Highway. And uh, now we're into the new year. Many of you dealing with problems on the road, maybe including the vehicle, not just the roads in Winnipeg. Uh, if you're thinking about a new whip for the upcoming year, start your search with the experts over at Not Auto Corp. Why not get into the car of your dreams with the help of the Not team at an incredible price over at Waverly McGillivray at Not Auto Corp. Incredible vehicles on the lot. And if there's a special one that you're looking for, they'll help you get it at the best possible price with their friends at Not Auto Corp. Not to mention the Winnipeg Car Lab's open as well. You can follow them on all the social media uh, feeds for full car wraps, striping, tinting, deckling, as well as rims and more. Not Auto Corp, Waverly and McGilvery, and online at not.ca. All right, Remo, we're going to bring Murata Tesh in here in a couple of minutes, but uh, I have to say, from following the chat throughout the... Uh, interview with Steve Coolius. That might have been the most excited the chat has been in a long, long time. And, uh, and I get it. I mean, Steve is amazing. He always brings unparalleled energy. Um, but he had some pretty accurate takes, I think, on the Winnipeg Jets, especially coming out of that loss to the Panthers last night. Yeah, I love reading the chat. Um, there were other comments. He makes me care about hockey. I love his energy. He's getting me excited. And I, I mean, that's why I've been a fan of his for so long. Uh, he brings the energy. Uh, he was like that off air was, uh, I think he said he had just had a workout before that, but he definitely brought it and, and you could tell he knows the stuff about uh, the Jets. And I think a lot of people here agree with what was said over the last uh, you know 15 minutes during that conversation. So great talk with Steven. Yeah, check out the uh, Cool Button podcast or Sirius XM. If you want to hear more from him, because I can see a lot of people in chat very, uh, very fired up. Yeah, I mean, Steve, uh, you know, basically one of the, the main dudes over at Sirius XM NHL Radio now, and as we mentioned, working with Craig Button on the Cool, on the, uh, the cool, uh, cool, uh, cool Button Hockey yeah, Podcast. Cool button. Um, the, uh, yeah, not to be confused with our friends at Cool Bet, we'll get to those lines a little bit later on today, but I have to say, Cooley is as close to a hockey savant as there is. And I know people were asking if he was on the score. He was on the score uh, for a number of years. He uh, was on TSN for a number of years. Um, and now he, um, you know, talks hockey each and every single day. Um, and it was also interesting room. I did not know he was from the Whitby area, but I mean, I know there's a lot of hockey players in and around there, but a real connection to, you know, one of the few real bright spots from last night's game. And of course that's Cole Perfetti. And it's easy to sort of get down on the current play to the team and where they're at. But I'll tell you what, that was one nice ray of sunshine on an otherwise sort of depressing night for the Winnipeg Jets and their fans with the loss to Florida because, uh, holy smokes, Cole got people out of their seat with those two assists last night. Yeah, the second one, um, the pass to Dubois. And, I mean, we're at nine games. I know there's a lot going on at today's availability. And you know, they talked on the broadcast, well, do you think he's going to play game 10 to kick in the ELC? And I don't know how you keep him out. He's clearly NHL ready. He's contributing. Uh, they, you know, with Ehlers out, they need guys who can score. Uh, you definitely, uh, definitely play him. And I see some people in chat be like, oh, no, they're not going to win. Don't use the contract. You can't just keep these guys in, <laughs> in the minors to delay. You can't piss them off and not play guys. You can't, I mean, the blatant service time manipulation, I think it screws over the players. It's not good. You want to see players who are capable of playing in the NHL, in the NHL. Happens in baseball all the time, and that's kind of part of the reason why they're, 
They're, they're fighting, the owners and the players. So if he's yeah. ready, which he seems to be, he should be in the NHL. After watching that game last night, the thought of Cole Perfetti being returned to the American Hockey League before tomorrow's game against Vancouver to maintain a year of team control is about as preposterous as anything that could be offered up on this show today. I mean, I know it had to be asked today, uh, and I know Ken wrote a piece on it, um, because the facts are that, you know, once you get to the 10 game, you know, the ELC doesn't slide. Uh, but, I mean, for crying out loud, he was the second star of the game last night. I mean, you know, if, if Cole Perfetti did not set up those two goals, imagine what the conversation would be like, and at least we had some good to come out of the game last night. Um, so, I mean... I guess we can talk about it and I'll, you know, Murad, I know asked Dave Lowry about that today mm -hmm. post practice, uh, but it's pretty clear and all but guaranteed that Cole's going to be on this team going forward mm -hmm. for tomorrow. And, you know, if he continues to to play the way that he's playing right now, along with Dubois and Connor, um, you know, he's going to be in the lineup each and every night. So uh, if you were a Moose fan that got a chance to, to see Cole Perfetti over the course of these last couple seasons playing in the American Hockey League, Savor those memories of Cole Perfetti as a moose because uh, I think he's now in the National Hockey League to stay. Yeah, and one thing, you know, you definitely noticed yesterday is that he'd been playing so well with Connor and Dubois at even strength. He finally got some power play time, and that's you know, where he uh, contributed on that goal. And, I mean, you, you have to look at the power play time on, on the ice. Cole Perfetti, 318. That's more than the uh, Shifley and Wheeler power play time, which... I mean, pretty shocking to me to see that. And I, I think the team is maybe slowly realizing here a bit of a changing of the guard from the Shafley Wheeler. And it's now Connor Dubois. They're the number one line. It's their team. And Perfetti going along for the ride, too. Um, I think that's, you know, pretty interesting. And you just saw, I mean, how the contrast in the styles of those two lines and the, their Connor Dubois line is just so exciting at this time. I mean, you can see, you know, the shots from Connor, you know, moves from. Uh, Perfetti and Dubois, he's got the big body crash to the net. So uh, I think that line is rolling, and it was nice to see them get on the board uh, twice yesterday. Yeah, it, it was. I mean, you know, again, you know, big picture, uh, the Jets are in a, uh, in a in a real tough spot right now. I mean, this last week and a half, um, you know, just the road trip, getting two points out of a possible eight, put them behind the eight ball. And uh, we all knew that this was going to be a huge, huge challenge taking on the Florida Panthers last night, and there were a few good things. But, you know, unfortunately, I think playing against an elite team like that really exposed some warts that, um, you know, maybe were even more prominent last night than, you know, they'd been over the course of uh, even the last road trip. Um, well, let's get to it all with our good friend Murata Tesh, who has uh, just raced back from the rink after... Uh, what well, was quite an interesting practice. Marat, thanks for doing this. Uh, great to have you on. Uh, just for your uh, uh, knowledge, Steve Coolius came in, the the human can of Red Bull uh, that he is last, uh, just finished up with maybe the most spirited and energetic visit in the history of this program. So uh, don't feel that we need to stick a firecracker up your rear end or anything like that coming off after Cooley. But uh, people are all fired up. And listen, I think a lot of people were fired up right when we started off the program today uh, because of what we saw and what we didn't see last night at the Winnipeg Jets. Just before we get to today's practice and a lot of news coming out of it, just what were your thoughts on uh, last night's game? And we spent a lot of time talking about the good and Cole Perfetti, but unfortunately, a lot of warts revealed by uh, by the hockey club last night against an elite Panthers club. I'm not. Uh, I'm not getting like, anything here. You know what? We're uh, I'm, Murad, I'm not sure. Check your uh, check your see if you're muted. Oh, I had him muted. Yes, I did have him muted. Sorry, Murad. There we are. Back to your thoughts on last night's game. Our apologies. Well, you never will. You guys me. couldn't stand him, eh? <laughs> um, I was just saying the Jets are just running an 0-3-2 and two stretch right now. So, I mean, the story of how they're playing right now is not good enough. And, and that's a fact. I think that, you know, coming out of the road trip, there's all the talk of their consistency, inconsistency. You know, I think that we're focusing a lot on those words 
because the team isn't good enough to lean on those top tier teams that they've been playing of late. And, you know, whether that's Boston or Pittsburgh or, you know, in last night's case, the Florida Panthers, one of the league's absolute elite, you see Winnipeg get exposed. And because there's still some quality on the Jets team, let's not throw it all out. You start looking for, okay, well, how is Winnipeg going to get back in the win column? And against Florida, they spotted the Panthers a goal early. I mean, Villa Hainala makes a not good pass up the wall. Jansen Harkins isn't on scene to pick that pass up either. Boom, boom, it's back in the it's in the back of the net, and a team's down by one. Hainala had a rough start, and that continues. But when you're doing that sort of thing, when when you're facing that sort of spotting the team a goal, and it happened multiple times, it wasn't just Hainala. I mean, look at I think it was the fifth goal where Anthony Duclair comes bursting into the zone. He beats Dylan at the line, and then he beats Schmidt on his way to the net, gets the shot off. There's a rebound there. There's poor defending coming from every single quality player on the Winnipeg Jets team right now. I don't think that there are exceptions to that. And that's why so much of the talk after last night's game, Paul Stastny talking about communication, talking about frustration, talking about basically he spilled the tea. There are so many things wrong in terms of, um, where that focus is at with the Jets right now, that um, that one, they're telling us about it. Two, you're seeing all of those breakdowns. They're leading to spotting teams' goals uh, against, and then they're not able. They're not so unbelievably good that they can come back from these obvious wars. And these are the kinds of communicative errors, the reads made poorly, the confusion about what somebody's supposed to do when. You know, we're halfway through the season, and they're talking about basic communication. That's a problem, and that's what they're working on rectifying, and they are working on it. It was uh, it was stunning at times, and I know I, I mentioned this earlier, but I thought Kevin Sawyer did a good job of sort of illuminating last night on the broadcast just how easy Florida was gaining the zone and maybe more dangerously taking the puck to the middle of the ice, to the slot, to high-danger chances with almost no resistance. and. You know, I hearken back to, you know, the last couple seasons when the motto of the team was to be connected. Um, you know, I know there were some new players in the lineup, but they looked anything but connected at the most important moments of the game last night, Murat, especially in their own end. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it becomes exacerbated against the top teams in the NHL because what a lot of them have in common, if it's Florida, if it's Colorado, um, certain players on uh, certain players on many other teams, but those are two staples where they're adding and activating their defense into the rush at all times. So there's, you know, there's a fourth wave through the neutral zone or even in the zone when Winnipeg set up in defense and people think that they have their, their guys marked. Well, then there's defensemen jumping into the play and creating confusion. That's tough to deal with when everybody is on the same page. It becomes an even bigger problem when players are a half step behind. And I think one of the key things to recognize as well is that this is team wide right now. I know I said it a second ago, but you know, you see mistakes from rookies and you see mistakes from veterans as well. When you talk about, like you say, Kevin Sawyer is illustrating how easy it is to get to the middle of the ice. Well, you see missed pinches from veteran defensemen in the neutral zone throughout last night's game. Brendan Dillon was for a few. Nate Schmidt got beat by one. Uh, Nathan Beaulieu and Villa Hainala, I mean, Hainala, the rookie, um, got split right up the middle not long after that first goal. Uh, Neil Pionk hasn't been his dominant self. Um, the forwards aren't necessarily all on the same page in terms of getting back and covering up for all of these sorts of things as well. So it's it's tough because they're in it sort of against these very, very good teams because they have enough quality to score from time to time. Um, but you have this sense that against the elites, they're never quite uh, playing in, in enough structure and with enough connection, to use your word or their word, to to sort of overcome things and tread water and reduce the quality of chances by just enough to get out of their zone without that goal. And then actually they'll score the goal that, you know, the Jets are probably good enough to score based on finishing talent alone. I, I'm certainly not the only one. I think that listened to uh, Paul Stasny speak after the game last night. And I mean, it was reminded me of, you know, him speaking at the end of last season when he said a bunch of things that really needed to be said. And I, it's interesting that you just said that, you know, not only is that to the point where we're hearing about it, because I think we all agree that for the most part, this stuff stays in until, I mean, you just look like, a, a, you know, an idiot if you're just not accepting what's happening in front of you. And, and, and now we're getting to it. But 
Um, tell us about what Nate Schmidt had to say after practice. We were sort of following your tweets afterwards, and you said this wasn't something you just throw in a tweet. He's always got a lot to say. I mean, uh, oh, 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 what was his perspective on uh, where the club is right now coming out of uh, that road trip and last night's loss? Well, I think the most illuminating uh, moment, and there were so many during the Nate Schmidt press conference, <clears throat> excuse me, um, were when he, he was responding to a question from Sean Reynolds about, okay, well, Dave Lowry and others are commenting on maybe a lack of attention to detail being an issue right now. Why is that the case? And, you know, Schmidt takes a long, thoughtful pause and then sort of opens up on it. And it's tough to, you know, you it's tough in a long paragraph, several minute answer to say exactly, to, to pull things out and pick out one sentence and, and over, overreach on it. Uh, so I'm still parsing through in my own mind for context. I'm going to be listening to the audio. But the things that repeated themselves were this. He compared Wy Winnipeg's team to some of the other ones he's played on. Washington, which is almost good enough to win the cup when he was there. He was on Vegas when Washington won the cup. And, and Vegas as well, lightning in a bottle, he called it. And one of the themes that he brought up was this idea that skilled players uh, in a team like Washington, for example, under Barry Trotz, were encouraged to make plays. You never want to take that away from it, from those players. Creativity is, is key. And those are the ones who are really, truly special players, even within the National Hockey League, that can win games for you. Uh, but if you make a mistake or if the play doesn't work out, um, you also have to be the first player coming back into your own end. Um, and I highlight that one because he sort of repeated that one a couple of times from different angles. And he didn't single any individual player out. Um, I think you can look at the defensive metrics for just about anybody who's played in the top six outside of Pierre-Luc Dubois and find that there's a big black hole, uh, you know, or a big red um, fiery hole in front of Connor Hellebuck whenever they're on the ice in terms of shot location. And there's there's a lot of evidence that says Winnipeg skilled players don't have the same defensive impacts of cup caliber skilled players who are scoring the same types of points. I'm not sure that that, like now we're at the extrapolation stage. The big thing though, I mean, was this idea that Winnipeg was communicating poorly, that they're still working on uh, improving their communication to help each other make the simple reads so that they can play as fast as they need to do. I mean, between the tone of poor communication and that needing to improve and this idea that, you know, not everybody, and again, he didn't name anybody individually, not everybody is getting back as soon as they make that mistake to cover things off and, and hold on to their own zone and go back the other way. I mean, Honestly, us, like those are pretty damning things to hear halfway through a season uh, with the kind of talent that Winnipeg has. Yeah, I mean, we're not talking about the first 10 games of the season. I mean, and on top of it all, you've got a new voice in the room, a new coach, and you've had the better part of a month of practices to presumably work on some of these things. I mean, one of my big takeaways last night, Murat, I just, you know, I listened to the guys talk about it afterwards and I'm just going to bed thinking about it. I'm like, what a job Dave Lowry has on his hands right now. Um, because, I mean, make no mistake about it. The expectations for this club are, are, are high this year. I mean, they're spending to the cap. They're in LTIR. Um, you know, we've seen this team play far better than it's playing right now. We've seen better results. And, you know, on top of it all, and granted, there's been some injuries in the COVID. Everyone's dealing with that this year. Um, you're starting to get some real nice... Um, contributions from players in spots where you need it, like in the top six with Cole Perfetti, and yet they're in the predicament that you have. Um, and the bottom line is, there's not a lot of time. We can talk about what we want. Oh, it's about half the season. Um, we've seen many times, I mean, they talk about U.S. Thanksgiving as a time where, you know, you pretty much know who's going to be in and out when it comes to the playoffs. I mean, um, this is an urgent situation for the Winnipeg Jets. And I, you know, I, I, I feel for Lowry because this is a very difficult situation coming in as an assistant with a lot of people expecting, you know, him just to turn it around. And unfortunately it's going to come down to those guys in the room. And I think we're hearing that from comments like you just described from Nate Schmidt. Yeah. I mean, five points spread and multiple teams to jump. I don't think people understand how mathematically difficult that is, even though it is just a few points. I mean, you got Don Luschician's model showing the Jets at something like a 20% chance to make the playoffs as of this morning. I double-checked that one. I think that's what I read this morning. But it is a horrendously small number, despite being just a few points away. And that's the sort of stakes that Winnipeg has found themselves in. And you can point to things. You can. I mean, 
So I think Lowry is four, five, and three since taking over. The shot metrics pretty close to fifty percent. The puck luck pretty terrible. And um, when you have such poor goaltending numbers and such poor finishing numbers on relatively even shot metrics of five on five, well. Typically, over a big sample, you say that's going to even out. Over a small sample, well, you can point to Connor Hellebuck's giveaway. You can point to Halen Ella's giveaway last night. You can point to these very specifically incredibly dangerous chances that the Jets are giving up. And, you know, whatever, whatever, what do they call it? The dead cat bounce that when a new coach comes in and things just magically get better because people tighten up. Whatever advantage you were hoping for from that is, is out the window right now. And they're kind of in the thick of it again. Absolutely. Special teams have improved a little. Five on five um, flow of play looks the same as it ever was. Um, but the goals certainly are, aren't there right now. And then you're starting to see over the last few games against these very good teams when things start to go poorly. And Nate Schmidt talked about this as well. Like there's a real sense of overcompensation of like of getting down, of falling out of team structure when down a goal, which you can't really have at the NHL level, especially against good teams. It, what it reminds me of, you ever meet somebody who's really sweet and wonderful and kind and nice and good matter in all situations, then you get them in front of a waiter and they're just a complete asshole. <laughs> do, you, do you know that guy? I mean, the, it reminds me of that because Winnipeg is a very good hockey team with tons of capability, with tons of skill, tons of talent. They can talk all day about playing things the right way, but they get down a goal early and they come off the rails a little bit. And that attention to detail that they keep talking about shows up in a lack of commitment to the way that they wanted to play the whole time. That's the metaphor in my mind right now. <laughs> That's a pretty good one, my friend. It's a pretty good one. Um, I mean, going forward into these next three games, I think, you know, I sort of laid it out. Um, you know, Vancouver, it's an afternoon game on Saturday against St. Louis and then the Philadelphia Flyers. And I mean, th this turnaround or getting things going and starting to stack up wins can't wait till after the all-star break. I mean, it, this is, this game tomorrow night is as close to a must win as I mean, the Jets are going to have, hopefully they'll have more. They'll put themselves into a position to continue to have it because you get a few more losses and winning the odd game is not going to really matter. Um, and of course, there's a, a lot of adversity right now, particularly when it comes to the blue line. Uh, we hear now Dylan Sandberg is out week to week. Johnny Kovacevic was out there. Certainly looks like Billy Hanel is going to get another chance to play. I mean, we won't obsess about Billy's game last night. I said to a lot of people, regardless of how it goes, I mean, let's not make too much out of one single game. It wasn't an easy spot to go in. Playing with Nate Beaulieu in your first game of the season, probably not really set up for success, but those were the players that they had. Um, fill us in on, you know, Kovacevic spot and just where the Jets are going into this incredibly important game tomorrow against Vancouver. Yeah, I mean, it was stunning to see the absence of Dylan Sandberg to today. And, you know, the interesting thing was Dave Lowry said the upper body injury he'll be out kind of week to week with was something lingering. So I, I kind of wonder, you know, if that was something that he was willing to, was trying to ignore just to make good on his NHL opportunity, but has maybe become a bit much. He, he didn't say it came out of last game specifically or anything like that. So now you have Jonathan Kovacevic in line to be yet another defenseman to play his first game, um, you know, joining Sandberg and Declan Chisholm earlier on. Uh, Billy Hanel obviously just played his first of the season, but has played before. And so now the question becomes, do you play him with Billy Hanela in a third pairing role and try to shelter them completely away from tough matchups uh, to the best of your ability against Vancouver? Do you try to partner them each to a veteran like a Nate Schmidt, like a Neil Pionk, um, or, or perhaps a, a Nathan Beaulieu as well in, in an effort to use that veteran savvy to sort of paper over or cover over whatever mistakes there are. And it's interesting because we've seen a little bit of both. When Sandberg and Chisholm came in, they played with veterans, and I think that helped them make really smooth debuts. Um, and Hainala, in his case, wasn't necessarily... I mean, Nathan Bolu is a veteran, but he's not that top four, top tier type that makes things easier on everybody. Analytically, the argument is usually that the quality of your team matters more than anything else. So the best way to shelter somebody might not be keep them away from the toughs, but actually make sure that they have the best available partner. We'll see what Winnipeg chooses to do. I asked Dave Lowry about that, and he said that they'll look at matchups and, and the state of the, the lineups that they're playing against. I think Vancouver isn't as scary as some of the teams the Jets have played lately. But that's also a game that, you know, you circle on your calendar, and I did this, 
heading into that road trip against four very dangerous teams and then knowing Florida was on the other end of it, you know, Winnipeg needed more than two out of 10 available points in that situation. That's for sure. But I think I sort of accepted that it wasn't going to be haymaking season for them. What you said just a second ago with Vancouver, St. Louis and Philadelphia coming up, they have to have to turn this into points right now. Um, And if they're going to be a good team, well, they got to beat the good teams. They didn't do that. If they're going to be a salvageable team, they've got to beat these ones. Right. You mentioned puck luck. I, I, I honestly, I've never seen anything like it when with Connor Hellebuck when he's got the puck on his stick. I mean, listen, the play against Pittsburgh, I thought was you know just a guy that's not that good in that route, just you know hitting the puck on a poor angle, and um, you know unfortunately it was Jeff Carter there to put it in, and it ended up in the net. The bounce that went off last night when he was clearing it out, and I can't remember what was the guy it, literally hitting the stanchion and a stick at the same time or coming out perfectly to the Panthers, but um, whatever. It happened again. Um, but to his credit, I thought he did make some big saves. I mean, like it wasn't like Florida just capitalized on the few chances that they had. They had a bunch, and it goes back to you know not being connected and the ease that they went into those high-danger scoring chances. What do you make of Hellebuck where he's at right now, though? Because he's playing a ton of hockey. And to be honest, considering the predicament that we've just laid out and what's behind him in the organization, I I expect him to keep getting thrown out there game after game after game. Yeah, I'll start with your last thought first. I expect the exact same thing. I mean, it's a desperate team. It's an interim coach. It's every situation that you could imagine. Oh, it's also a relatively unestablished backup. I know Eric Comrie's had some success earlier on in the season, but it's not the same as having LB back there. It's not the same as having, you know, a 1A, 1B situation. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons to think Connor Hellbuck's going to play an awful lot of games. Uh, now, in terms of his performance, I think he's stopping a lot of dangerous opportunities. That's for sure. His save percentage numbers are down. His puck handling is getting him into trouble. And yeah, I agree with you. Last night, that particular one, luck. Some of the other things that we've seen, I mean, I think that's just a case of a guy playing a puck poorly. And I don't think that that puck handling is a strength of Connor Hallibuck's game. And it's interesting in a small sample, like these last several, if you just want to break the season since Lowry has been coach, I mean, one or two goals based on puck handling errors is huge. That's a huge swing. It's like a, it's like in the playoffs. He's, he's given up goals, I think, on puck handling errors to Vegas and Calgary as well. And when you spot a team a goal in a small sample, that can cost you a series. That can cost you a game at the very least. And he's been doing that from time to time over his career. The one thing that I would also be curious about right now is what those rebound numbers are like. And, you know, it's just a by eye thing right now. Other teams are beating Winnipeg to rebounds in front of Connor Hellebuck. They're on the doorstep. Part of that might be the ease of access that they have to get there. They're not getting pushed out of there. Part of that might be, despite there being some size on Winnipeg's blue line, no matter who it is, you know, whether it was the biggest one in Logan Stanley, the smallest one in Villa Hanel, or anybody in between, nobody is dominating at those stick check battles in front of the net and those box outs that stop those rebounds from getting buried. But also, I think Connor Hellebuck's giving up his fair share right now as well. So in addition to the highlight reel saves, in addition to him genuinely being a, an excellent NHL goalie, I think perhaps that's a sign of fatigue. And that's something that, you know, before I'm going to put that into print and, and, and stand by, I want to support that with evidence. But that's what it looks like is happening to me right now. Well, and, and just on that point, and again, I'm not sure. I mean, you would know this better than me. If there is a stat for just one-on-one puck battle, um, but I mean, I was joking, and I mean, maybe this is an exaggeration. But in last night's game, when there was a Jet and a Panther on a puck, whether one guy or the other had it, and they went in and started, it must have been 80 20 in favor of the Panthers coming out with it and maintaining possession. And I mean, we can talk about being connected, we can talk about making the most of chances, all that stuff. There is an element of this game where it comes down to winning one on one battles. And if you go back over the course of these five games, but it was in spades last night. Um, the Jets just simply aren't good enough at that. And I mean, I'm not sure whether that's a matter of will or skill or what, but if that alone doesn't turn around, um, you know, this is an uphill battle that I don't think that hill will be able to be climbed. Yeah, I mean, it's an important part of the game. I, I think that we all do those mental calculations when a puck is in the corner or there's a battle that we know is about to happen. And you sort of do that thing in your mind. Well, how likely is this that Winnipeg is going to come out with the puck or who, who should win this puck? And, you know, I, I sort of agree with you, especially in front of the net, especially on the wall, Winnipeg isn't winning enough of those battles. 
and it's it's leading to to them getting burnt, especially when it's off of a rebound play and those sorts of things. And it, it's disappointing. I keep harping on this, but you know, Brendan Dillon was supposed to be one of the answers to that. Continued progression from Logan Stanley was supposed to be one of the answers to that. Nathan Beaulieu for, you know, all of the consternation about where, what place in the de- depth chart he has. I mean, that's supposed to be his bread and butter. Meanwhile, Neil Pionk's a competitor. Josh Morrissey's a, you know, a top four defenseman as well. You're expecting guys like that to be able to sort of batten down those hatches. And it hasn't happened sort of irrespective of the player. And I think that's a concern. And I don't know if that necessarily speaks to something systemic or the team having issues with the new cross-checking rules or um, or perhaps even it happens before the net front moment where, you know, off of an entry, the Jets are allowing um, allowing teams to enter with speed and with numbers so that defensemen are frozen from, from perhaps engaging before that net front battle even happens. Um, there are a lot of things not going well defensively for Winnipeg. And I think battles are one of them. And I think... I've accepted for a while that that's an inevitable, you know, corollary with having your best players be, you know, relatively more skilled than sandpaper players. Your Kyle Connors, your Nick Ehlers, your Mark Shifley's of the world. You know, all those players have poor defensive numbers with the Jets so far this season. Um, but you see the elite teams, guys of those same statures win more battles and you see that if it's florida or if it's tampa bay or whoever else it is size uh, size aside that was uh that was on display big time last night hey uh, 30 seconds we do have to go but um uh, let's finish off on a positive note what a game for cole perfetti he's here to stay absolutely here to stay um deserves it the opportunities that he created that led to goals that you saw them highlight reels the second one was even prettier than the first he's thinking it at an nhl level he's executing it at an nhl level and he's creating chances for very good line mates at an nhl level uh 10 games no question not no drama whatsoever cole perfetti is a winnipeg jet well great stuff marat thanks so much for doing this uh we should mention that um you know some interesting stuff in your latest piece at the athletic with takeaways blake wheeler's return and more make sure to check that out and uh Look forward to speaking with you, my friend, uh, next week. Uh, hopefully under a little more positive circumstances. And you know what needs for that happen? This team needs to put up a few wins before our next conversation. Give us the W's. Let's have some fun. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Thanks so much, Marat. Uh, there's Marat Atesh at WPG. Marat, and of course, if you're not already subscribed to The Athletic, what are you waiting for? Check out his latest piece at theathletic.com. All right. Huge, huge guest coming up in just a minute uh, as we get into the GOAT, Jerry Rice on Winnipeg Sports Talk. A big shout out to our friends at Little Brown Jug, uh, Winnipeg's favorite craft beer brewed at their brewery and tap room down on William Avenue. They've got the 1919, the winter variety pack with four amazing beers for the winter. And of course, the uh, special anniversary brew, the Brute IPA, Brood celebrating their five-year anniversary that was just happened last month in December. And for the month of January, if you're not heading out, Little Brown Jug's offering free delivery. So if you can't get down to the tap room, go to littlebrownjug.ca, free delivery all month. They'll get it straight to you. Start off with the 1919, add a few other great beers, maybe check out some merch, and then wait for the Little Brown Jug guys to deliver it to you. Uh, Scotty's gets going on the weekend. Cannot wait for that. I might hit the uh, Scotties on the cool bet lines a little later on, but uh, we're going to have extensive curling coverage and Princess Auto curling reports all next week as the best in the game, including Team Canada, Kerry Anderson, Manitoba's representative, Mackenzie Zacharias, and the wildcard team of Tracy Fleury look to begin their quest to be Canadian champions. Of course, Princess Auto, in addition to being a great sponsor of Jen Jones and curling across the country, is where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Two Winnipeg locations, but you can start your shopping 24-7, 365 online at princessauto.com. Jets back in action against Vancouver tomorrow. Great night to get up to Boston Pizza. And of course, Sunday is Championship Sunday in the National Football League. Niners, Rams, Chiefs, Bengals. It's going to be a great day. No better place to do it than Boston Pizza. Hooked up with a bunch of buddies down at the Charleswood BP on Saturday. Watch the Jets, watch the Titans, Bengals. Got into some wings, some pizza, some cactus cuts. Even a few schooners was a great, great time. And if you can't get out to Boston Pizza for the game, order it in. Call your local Boston Pizza or get on it online and see all those great game day deals at bostonpizza.com.
All right. Uh, Nelson Noje, still to come later on in the program. We will get to our cool bet lines. Uh, but what an opportunity for us to welcome in certainly the most decorated guest in the brief history of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Um, let's get right to it. Had a chance just earlier before the show today to catch up with the GOAT, the greatest receiver in NFL history, and according to many, the greatest football player in the long storied history of the National Football League. Here's our conversation with the one and only Hall of Famer, Jerry Rice. Jerry, thanks so much for doing this. It's it's a real honor. Thank you. Man, crazy football, huh? No. Oh. Well, listen, when I knew that we had the opportunity to talk to you today, um, we wanted to get to what's coming ahead of us, but I don't think there could be a better time to speak to a legend like yourself uh, coming off the weekend of football we just had. I mean, uh, I know you're still all over the game. I mean, uh, I really, from start to finish, that was, people are saying it, I don't think there's much of a debate, the most exciting, incredible weekend of playoff football we've ever seen in the NFL. Yeah, you know, both number ones, they get knocked off. Then you have this game be between Buffalo and KC that just like it was up for grabs and it just kept going back and forth. You know, Patrick Mahomes, then you had uh, Josh Allen. And I think Buffalo did everything possible to try to win that football game. And they still ended up losing the game. And it came down to 13 seconds. 13 seconds. Do not kick the ball all the way to the end zone. Strip of the ball. Take some time off the clock. Do not let Kelsey run straight down the field and, and, and get in field goal range. So it was a lot of mistakes made, but, you know, exceptional football. Then my San Francisco 49ers, they go into Green Bay. Green Bay, Lambeau Stadium. You know, <laughs> the history behind that, and they were able to get a win. You know, I want to get to the Niners with you in a minute, but just on that Casey Buffalo game, um, you know, we've seen, you know, offense become more and more the driving force in this football game, certainly over the past few years. But the evolution of the quarterback position um, has been phenomenal to see. And I'm not sure there's been a better display of that in one game by both guys on either side of the football. I mean, you got to feel heartbroken for Josh Allen because yeah. he could not have played much better. But uh Patrick Mahomes continues to prove that he is one of the most special players that's ever hit a football field. Yeah, he's just like Clint Eastwood. I mean, the ball just it comes out of it just comes out of nowhere. Then when you have a receiver like uh, you know, Tyreek Hill, that he, he's waving bye-bye to people as he's running to the end zone. <laughs> I've never seen anything like this. And you, you know, he makes the right decisions, right decisions. Uh, he puts the ball in the hands of his playmakers, and he just let them go play. So, you know, yeah, we know he's the captain of the ship, and he's going to make the right decisions. But, man, what a show. And um, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, watching this game coming up be between the Bengals and, and KC. Now, um, you know, I'll, I want to ask you about some of the receivers in general, but let's get to the Niners to go in because they're doing this in a very different way. I mean, it's kind of funny. I mean, if you wa if you had never watched the National Football League before and you tuned in Saturday night and watched a, a tough, defensive, low-scoring game and then tuned in on Sunday night and watched the Bills and the Chiefs, I mean, you might think you were watching an entirely different sport. Yeah, it, it was like no defense. He, and, and, and I'm one of those guys that, you know, when I came into the league, this was taught to me early during my career that you win championships with defense. And we had, we had an outstanding defense back in the day. And now you're seeing points being put up, uh, you know, it, it for San Francisco to go into Lambar, I mean, uh, Lambeau Field and really uh, not let them put so many points on the board, you know, because they got one of the best quarterbacks with Aaron Rodgers. And, uh, you know, to have it to come down to a field goal to win the game, uh, it was exceptional. Then to watch those other teams put up numbers like they did, it was just like, you know, uh, guns blazing. I mean, two of the best quarterbacks in the league just airing it out, you know, putting the ball in the hands of their playmakers, having a great time out there on the football field. And just like, you know, you just knew it was going to come down to the final seconds. Well, um, and, you know, and that is sort of part of football now in 2022, which has changed somewhat since, um, you know, the glory days of your 49er teams. 
but they still do say defense wins championships and you, you can't win it without a strong defense. Uh, is the defense, the special teams, the running game, the brain of Kyle Shanahan, is that what's given the 49er nation the confidence to go in and do it again against the Rams on the weekend and get back to the big game? I think it's a combination of, of everything with the special teams. And, and I used to always go and sit in those meetings. I wanted those players to know how important uh, that phase of the game, uh, you know, you know, was to uh, uh, to the San Francisco 49ers. And, and they would look at me like I was weird. Like, why is Jerry in this special team? Meet? You know, he's not going to return any any uh, punts or kickoffs or he's not going to run down on kickoffs or uh punts or something like that, but I just needed to show them how important that was. And positioning is everything. And uh, and it's going to come down to defense, though. you got to be able to stop someone. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for uh, the San Francisco 49ers. I, I, I love our defense right now. I like the defensive line. They put in pressure on the quarterback. They'll get into the quarterback. The secondary is holding up. And, uh, and if they continue that, and we continue to run the ball, I feel like we have a legitimate chance. And, you know, with Debo Samuel, what he's doing out there on the football field, I want to get Brandon Ayuk a little bit more involved. And, uh, you know, George Kittle is going to be George Kittle. So we still need to continue just to run that ball, then just uh, depend on our defense. Well, And, you know, sometimes the game dictates the way you call and what you need out of your offense. Um, Because, you know, while it's been somewhat pedestrian to get to this point, Jerry, uh, we all remember week 18 with their season on the line down 17, nothing to the Rams. Um, and they got it done. I, what did you make of that turnaround? And, and what does that do for a team playing for their playoff lives to get that done in the final week and how they've kind of continued that momentum going into these NFL playoffs? You know, I think it really builds uh character. It, it shows that, you know, like you, you find a way to win no matter what. I, I think this team is, uh, is, Gaining confidence. Uh, no one thought that the Niners would be in a position that they're in right now. Be because at the start of the season, it was like a roller coaster ride. It was going back and forth. And I think we gave away one game uh, to the Green Bay Packers with Aaron Rodgers. I think he had, he had 37 seconds on the clock. And he moved the ball all the way downfield, uh, you know, to uh, win that football game. So that one hurt, but we had quite a few games to really hurt us and still this team they fought back they have the opportunity uh to go to the Super Bowl everything er everything is on the line now it's like who plays their best football who plays their best football uh is going to move on and I think we have a legitimate chance we have beat the Rams like six times in a row and, and I think we can do it again it's not going to be easy and, and, you know, with uh, uh, the Rams, what they're doing, because they have some exceptional players, too. So it's going to be tough for the Niners to go in there and get one, but I feel like we can. Now, you mentioned Debo Samuel. I've got to ask him. He's the offensive star right now for the San Francisco 49ers. And it, it's been so interesting to see the way Kyle Shanahan has utilized him. Um, he's not only one of the most devastating receivers, but he's kind of turned into one of the best running backs as well. The athlete that Debo is and the way he's used, how? It, why is that so unique and how has it been so successful? You know, I think with Debo, uh, man, he's a slash runner, running back. He's that receiver. Any If he touches the ball, he has that vision where it's like everything slows down a little bit. It, it, it was the same scenario with me because I, I could see things happening at a very fast pace and I knew the areas to get to uh to make big plays and he has that vision and i think you know as long as the san francisco 49ers continue to get the ball in the hands of debo samuel i think we have a legitimate chance uh, you know while we're talking about receivers i have to ask you about cooper cup he was the triple crown winner i mean he put up jerry rice like numbers he led the league in receptions he led the league in yardage he led the league in touchdowns and another guy that came from a smaller school i mean uh, what stands out from cooper cup when you watch him play and uh, how is he turned into uh, right now the number one receiver in football i think uh cooper cup you look at his route running uh he's very shifty uh you know he's he almost like he, he puts the defensive back asleep. You know, 
it, it's so subtle. Then all of a sudden you see that burst. Then you see that confidence where, you know, he, he makes those incredible catches. So it's going to be exciting to see, you know, Cooper Cup and also Debo Samuel. Because as receivers, we feed off that. We want to go up against the best. We, we, we want to showcase what we're capable of doing on that given day. So it's going to be a, a great matchup going back and forth. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited about seeing this. NFL Pro Football Hall of Famer and DraftKings Ambassador Jerry Rice with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Uh, as far as the AFC Championship goes, I'm a Chiefs guy. I could talk about Mahomes and Kelsey yeah. and Hill all day. But respect where it's due. I mean, what a turnaround for the Cincinnati Bengals in this season, led by Joe Burrow and another incredible young receiver in Jamar Chase. Uh, you know, Bengals fans have been through a lot over the past 30 years, but man, it's got to be exciting in the natty seeing those two guys doing what they're doing. Yeah, you know, they're having a fantastic time and they're making plays. You know, uh, Joe Burrows, he has confidence in uh, Jamal Chase. And Jamal Chase is going to run, you know, he's going to take it deep. He's going to uh, make those catches on the knee. Then he got that running ability too. And, and I was always one of those receivers that I enjoy catching the ball on the knee. Now I could use my creativity to get to the end zone. And, and, and it's like everybody's chasing you and you know they're out to hurt you. And the hair on your back is going to stand up just a little bit more. And, you know, you're going to be a little bit faster. And I think you see the same thing in, uh, you know, Jamal Chase and stuff like that. But uh, very potent uh, combination, and uh, and I think they're going to do well. They uh, That being said, they got to go to Arrowhead and play a team that they just beat a couple weeks ago. I mean, uh, do you give them a chance against the Chiefs, or uh, do you think your 49ers and the Chiefs are going to be meeting again in a rematch of the Super Bowl a couple years ago? You know, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter now. If you... Anywhere you have to go now, you have to have the confidence that you're going to win. And, you know, because everything is on the line, we don't get as many opportunities as, uh, you know, baseball players, uh, basketball players. You only get one shot. And and you better be on your game. So, yeah, I'm sure they feel like they can go uh, in, into Arrowhead and, and, and get a win. And uh, that's just like with the San Francisco 49ers going to uh, SoFi. You know, we feel like we can go in there and get a win. And uh, but it's easy said than done. The execution, everything has to happen during the week. The preparation is everything. Once you do that, you give yourself an opportunity to go and do something special. Jerry, I've got to ask you about what you've got going on with the DraftKings folks heading into the weekend. But just before that, are you ever envious watching today's game, thinking about what you and your guy Joe Montana might have been able to do under the current rules? I mean, you got all the records anyways, but I mean, I can't imagine having you and Joe on my fantasy football team in today's game. No, you know what? I played in the era that I wanted to play in. I, I I really did, and and I don't question anything. You know, I've been asked so many times, oh, my, my God, you know, all the stats that you put up, you know, back when you played, think about this, you know, what you can put up now. But, man, it was just something special about that, the physicality of it and stuff like that. I remember defensive backs being up in your face. It was a battle all the way downfield. Some of the best guys like Deion Sanders, Daryl Brill, Daryl Green, it was physical. The entire time. If I was on the left side and the ball was being thrown on the right side, I was get, still getting hit on the left side. <laughs> and the ball is not even coming my way. So, yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't go back and change anything. Uh, Jerry Rice, our guest now. Uh, Jerry, you're, of course, working with uh, DraftKings, great friends of ours. We're already working on our lineups for Sunday's games. Uh, but uh, fill us in on what you're doing as a DraftKings ambassador and what you've got going on for the final four of the NFL playoffs. Well, you know what? It was great uh, working with DraftKings uh, for the NFL playoffs. And they're the leader in sports technology and entertainment. And if you haven't seen the commercial, you got to see the commercial, man. I'm serious. I had so much fun uh, being a part of that because I got a chance to just uh, just pour this cooler on this guy like 20 times or more in the bed, on the couch in the front yard, you know, this better just kept winning. And that's how we celebrate. You know, I, I never got it, you know, the opportunity for the cooler to get poured on me or anything like that. But man, it just, it, it was so much fun. And, and I got to give him an award. It got to be like the Jerry Rice award because I just kept pouring it on him. 
and he just kept taking it. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's just amazing to have the opportunity uh, to work with, uh, you know, uh, DraftKings. It was so much fun. It brought out the little kid in me all over again because we never get the opportunity to do something like that, like a commercial. It's always serious. This was just fun for me. Well, I, I can tell you that um, we have a lot of fun playing DraftKings here. Uh, we do a lot of hockey, um, but we're all over the National Football League, and uh, we know when it comes down to uh, sports, and we saw it on Sunday with the TV ratings that the NFL continues to be king. And, uh, man, what a weekend we've got coming up for both the players and people that are going to be having some fun playing on DraftKings. All right, man, look, let's go Niners. It's time. Hey, I get fired up. I still get fired up. I, I have to control myself. I really do because, you know, I, I still love the game of football. I'm very supportive. And I feel like we have some of the greatest fans ever. You know, they're going to be out there. Those are those diehards. And, and they really motivate us to go out and play our best football. Got to tell you, this has just been an incredible honor. Cannot thank you enough. Uh, enjoy the games this week, and fingers crossed we will have that Super Bowl rematch of a couple years ago with the <laughs> Niners and the Chiefs going at it. Jerry, all the best. Thank you so much, and uh, we really do appreciate it. All right. Hey, either one we're going to have, it could be that one, or we could have Cincinnati and San Francisco again. Oh, and you I, know who won that one, right? Yeah, yeah oh, I do. I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wasn't Cincy. Have a great one, Jerry. Thank you All so right, much. Take care. Oh, man, what a thrill that was. Um, Jerry Rice, what can I say? Uh, the, the best to ever do it, joining us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. If that doesn't get you fired up for Sunday, I don't know what will. And uh, I listen, you all know who I'm going to be backing on Sunday. Uh, but in the NFC Championship, I'll be going for the Niners, and I have a feeling there's a few new Niner fans with us in the chat right now joining us on uh, on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Thanks again to Greg and the DraftKings folks for helping us set up Jerry Rice on the program. Wow, that was uh, phenomenal. All right, we're going to talk a little moose hockey. Nelson Noje coming up in just a second. Uh, before we do that, I want to give a big thank you, speaking of people that have been behind us for a long time, to the Nick and Nicky DQ group. Four locations in Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba, the DQ in Niverville and the DQ in Northgate, both with drive throughs if you don't want to get out of the car, the DQ at Polo Park, and of course the DQ on St. Anne's in St. Vital, which is now open year-round and can deliver to you via Skip the Dishes and Uber Eats, whether it's the Ultimate Grill Burger, the new Buffalo Chicken Fingers, the Ice Cream Novelties and more, they're ready for you. It's phenomenal 12 months a year, even if it's a little chilly outside and it's never too cold to mix in a blizzard. And as far as if you've got a little party or an event coming up, you know, those are always better with the DQ ice cream cake. And uh, they'll help you save a lot of time. You want to get a custom-made DQ cake? Hit them up on Instagram, at DQ Manitoba. Let them know what you want on it. They'll get it done for you, and you can pick it up fast and easy at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQ locations. And, uh, well, we just had one goat on in Jerry Rice, and when it comes to uh, the best Canadian whiskey around, you know that it's Canadian Club. Proud sponsors of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers is their official whiskey and the official spirit of WST. Uh, and, of course, the sponsors of maybe the most famous 15 Minutes in digital sports talk, the Friday Marble Race here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. We can tell you that the new batch of WST and Canadian Club hoodies are on order. We'll get them in the next couple of weeks. Eric, we'll have yours for you. And your next chance to win with us and our friends at Canadian Club is Friday afternoon here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. All right, we will get to the cool bet lines before the end of the program. But, you know, we talked about the Jet game last night. Obviously disappointing and a real tough spot for the club right now going into these final three games for the All-Star break and then a hell of a schedule coming up in February. Very different story for the American League club in town, the Manitoba Moose. Uh, they sit in second place right now in the Central Division, 22-10-2-1 so far, and have, dealed, have dealt with about as much adversity as uh, as any team has with a revolving door coming out of the, uh, in and out of the dressing room. Let's welcome in one of the veterans of the Moose, Nelson Noje to the club right now. Nelson, what's going on? Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Hey, you know, um, you know, first off, congratulations on the season. I mean, it has been wild. And, you know, obviously we haven't been able to attend games over the last little bit because of uh, everything that's going on. Uh, but 
I mean, between COVID and call-ups, um, I'm not sure we've ever seen a season like this. And yet, it doesn't really matter who is putting on the jersey, the Manitoba Moose, who's in net, who's in the lineup, who's on the power play. You guys just keep on getting it done and getting points. Um, tell us about the season so far and how you guys are doing it. It's been a lot of fun. And I mean, as you said, we, we've, we've had a lot of success here uh, early on in the season. And and uh, I mean, each and every day, we just try and continue to build on that and try and keep that momentum going. Uh, as you talk, as you touched on, it's been a bit of a revolving door in our dressing room too. Like we we've had a lot of new faces um, with both injuries, COVID, guys going up to the taxi squad, guys going up to the jet active roster. So there's been a lot of turnover in our room, a lot of opportunity, and guys are making the most of those opportunities and. Um, we're just, we're buying in collectively as a group is into what we want to accomplish as a team and um, we're getting results at, at the end of the night. So it's been a lot of fun. I joked with coach Morrison when he was on with us last week or the week before that, um, you know, for the last couple of games, when we spoke, I mean, you're probably going to be putting the stickers on the front of everyone's helmets, like Timbits hockey, just to remind people what guys names were. I mean, from a player's perspective, I mean, how bizarre was it? And you guys were literally bringing in not just one new guy, but like a bunch of new guys, sometimes on a game by game basis. Yeah, it's crazy. Like just to kind of put it in a perspective, like I, I had COVID on the last road trip uh, along with a few other guys, we went into protocol, we had guys called up. So you'd think, okay, we have new faces in the dressing room. You're probably going to see them at some point. Between my, myself getting COVID with a group of guys, there were other positives throughout that road trip. And more guys started coming back. There were faces that came through that dressing room that I didn't see over a five-day five day period. So it's uh, it's been a lot of turnover, like I said, and a lot of new faces. Um, but it's it's kind of neat at the same time, too. You kind of you get to meet a lot of new people along the way. And um, when we're winning, it makes it that much better. Well, and of course, everyone, uh, you know, whether you're new or you're a veteran in your case, I mean, everyone seems to be pulling on the rope in the same way and buying into, uh, you know, what Mark Morrison's preaching. Tell us about the new head coach. I mean, uh, you played for a long time for Pascal. Um, what's Mark been like to to play for and uh, what's he done for your club as um, you continue to chase uh, a Calder Cup? It's been great. It's been it's been really good. I mean, Mark's coaching style as opposed to Pascal's is a lot different. So I think for guys like myself who've been with this club now for X number of years, it's been an adjustment period. But with that being said, um, I think, and it's, it's funny you bring that up because this was asked uh, of me in the uh, post game interview of after our game on Sunday, as, as far as Mo's coaching style and being more of a player coach and how that's been for our group. And I think that's been really good for a lot of guys. I mean, it's, it gives guys uh, a sense of allowing them to be comfortable uh, with the game that they play and, and knowing that they have a little bit of freedom to be creative with what they do on the ice. And, and uh, I mean, Mark, Mark puts the game plan out there for us that, that we want to accomplish as a group. And then um, as I just said, having that little extra bit of freedom for guys to do what they want, feel comfortable uh, helps us just play, play a better sound game for 60 minutes. Nelson Noje, the Manitoba Moose is with us on Winnipeg sports talk. Uh, Nelson, a number of young defensemen on the uh, Moose have gotten a chance to uh, do what you did back in the 16-17 season, and that was play your first game in the National Hockey League. Uh, you, at that point, actually got 10 in that season. Um, but, you know, from a guy that, you know, is a bit more of a veteran, certainly at the AHL level, has had a taste of the NHL, um, what was it like seeing the likes of, uh, well, Dylan Sandberg and Declan Chisholm? And Declan, interestingly enough, I mean, you know, and maybe this isn't the case. I think the perception was that, you know, you've got this sort of depth chart of some guys that maybe were drafted higher, um, but those two guys come in, play well. It's a 3 nothing shutout win. Dylan Samber gets a few more games. Now it looks like Johnny Kovacevic might get his shot. Billy got a chance yesterday. I mean, uh, what's that like for a guy that has been doing that, has done that before, as well as a teammate, seeing these young players, um, you know, get a chance to taste the uh, the National Hockey League? I couldn't be happier for these guys. I mean, I've been here now longer than those guys have, given given my age and uh, getting drafted before them and having not left the organization. So I've got to see these guys grow from their first, second development camps into their first year pros and into the, the people and the players that they are. So, um, I mean, there's a little bit of sense of pride there too, knowing that, I mean, 
myself, I try and be a leader in the dressing room and hopefully um, have given these guys a shoulder to lean on uh, throughout, throughout the early years of their career. And, and knowing what they're going through as far as the emotions and the excitement of, of playing in their first NHL game. So um, it's just, it's a good feeling for everyone around. And, and like I said, extremely happy for those guys. What advice did you give them before playing their uh, first game in the National Hockey League outside of uh, challenging and fighting uh, one of the toughest guys in the league? <laughs> I didn't have to give those guys a whole lot of advice. I mean, they're, they're uh, very highly skilled and highly talented players. And um, I mean, for those guys that I did reach out to, I just said, just play your game, keep things simple and you'll adjust quicker than you think. Well, I've got to ask you, I mean, and people will kill me if I don't bring this up, but I mean, your first game famously was, I believe, against the Columbus Blue Jackets, and you somehow ended up dropping the gloves with Jared Bull. I mean, uh, was that part of the plan beforehand? Or uh, Tell us about that, but and what it's like for a young defenseman to go up and, wow, this is it. I'm, I'm, playing, in the, I'm playing in the NHL. Yeah, it was cool. Like it, I think that fight was in my fifth game, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and, and Bull was playing for Anaheim at the time, I'm pretty sure. And uh, I was paired with Mark Stewart on the back end, and it was just a, it was a high hit. It was in the second period. I'll never forget it. Like it's it's still one of my most memorable moments of my hockey career to date. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think I knew exactly what I was doing or getting myself into. It was just one of those things that I felt was right in the heat of the moment, and I wanted to do whatever I could to stay at that level. So, um. Yeah, I mean, I went to the penalty box, not really knowing, not being a whole lot much of a fighter. So I go to the penalty box and there's less than five minutes left in the period. So you're actually supposed to go to the dressing room at this point. And uh, the crowd at the MTS Center at the time, there was just electric. I'll, I'll never forget that feeling. And, and just the boys rallying around you for, for sticking up for a teammate, especially that early on in my career. Uh, Nelson, um, you know, back to this season, we've talked about the success of the team with everything that has been thrown at you and it continues to be with the amount of defensemen the Jets have out and the young guys that are now up with the club. Um, but in your role, um, you know, that's kind of developed over the course of the years. I mean, as a veteran player, how is it different for you than uh, maybe when you were trying to cut, get your feet wet as a, you know, just as a pro to now being an established member of the club that, you know, obviously is looked on for leadership and a big, big part of the team, uh, both on the ice, but I'd imagine also off the ice to help sort of let these young men know what it takes to be a professional and, you know, how to handle themselves on both sides of things as they uh, try to, you know, follow their dreams. For sure. I think at this point it's, it's leading by example. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I mean, it's, the game's changed so much. Like when I remember when I was a young guy, there were a lot of older guys. Like I, you never looked at a 25 year old as being necessarily an older veteran player at the time. Cause the American league was a little bit older in my opinion. Um, but it's crazy that at 25 right now, I'm considered an older guy. And um, but I mean, back to, back to my point of just leading by example, it's, it's being consistent every day and doing all the right things at the rink, whether that be on the ice or off the ice on both practice days, off days, treatment days, game days. Um, it's just, it's paying attention to those little details. And, and those are now habits for a guy like me having been around it for so long and just trying to not necessarily preach to the younger guys, but just, just make sure that they try and stay on that same path so that they can achieve the utmost uh, success in their own careers. Hey, you know what I, uh, you know, I uh, obviously asked you about some of the defensemen because you would have played with them and practiced with them, but uh um, what did you, uh, what did you garner from Cole Perfetti's time with the Manitoba Moose? I'm not sure whether he's coming back anytime soon. We saw a couple just, I mean, big league plays last night for him in his ninth game looks to play 10 tomorrow. And, uh, that will mean as ELC goes, I, I think we all expect him to be here for a while, but I mean, um, you know, you saw him last year into this year, fill us in on, uh, you know, what, what you saw from him coming in day one to, uh, now what we're seeing him do it in a, in a top six role with Winnipeg. He's a remarkable young player. He, his hockey sense is some of the best that I've ever seen um, in, in a player that I've played against and I've played with. Like you look at a guy like Mark Shifley too. I got to be around Mark Lotz last year uh, being on the taxi squad and his hockey and sense and hockey IQ is through the roof. And I see a lot of that in Cole as well. Um, getting the handful of games that I did last year in the American League and playing alongside Cole for those 12 games. And he was making plays that he was 18 at the time, if I, if I'm not mistaken, 
because he's 19 now, correct? I think he just turned right? 20. Or just turned 20. Okay. So anyways, and, and just the plays that he makes and the poise that he has playing a man's game at that, at that young of age, it, it's, it's remarkable. And, and you look at a guy like him and he's just getting his feet wet in the NHL. As he said, nine games pushing for 10. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping for his sake that we don't see him at the American league level ever again. Um, but, but the ceiling that he has as a player and, I mean, it goes for most players when they make the jump to the NHL. The more repetitions you get at that level, the more games you play, the more shifts you get, you get more comfortable, and you really start to flourish as a player into the player that you were drafted as when you were playing junior hockey. So I think Cole has a lot more to go yet, which is, I think, a huge compliment to him. I mean, that that's just how highly I speak of him as a player and how how good and effective of a player that I see him being in the NHL. Hey, you know, one other teammate that I have to ask you about is Mikhail Burden. And and I say it not to judge his goaltending, but just as a defenseman, how different is it to play with a guy like that that often roams around as if he's another third defenseman? Hell, maybe a forward sometimes. Tell us about the Birdman and the unique game that he brings to you guys, especially as a guy that's on the ice with him. Yeah, we talk about that all the time in the dressing room, how um active he is out of his net it, it's so nice as a defenseman when you have a goaltender who plays the puck like that and plays it well for the most part um there'll be times where birdie gets caught a few times and and maybe is a little too ambitious with his puck handling ability but um more often than not it's crazy like as a defenseman you always got to bust back and try and get get first touch on a puck or, or get back and be an option for the goaltender but when you have the Birdman in there it's <laughs> you're not necessarily an option for him, regardless of how open you are. There, there's, there's a lot of times where he's completely bypassing the D and he's looking up ice to try and send it to a forward who's already in the neutral zone or is just coming back into the D zone. So he's a very unique goaltender. And, and uh, I mean, a lot with him too. I think he's going to have a, a lot of NHL potential too, if he kind of settles into to playing some games up there and, and continues to play the puck the way that he does. Hey, just speaking of goaltending, I mean, now how about Evan Cormier? I mean, wasn't even on the team. You had Holm and Burden. I mean, both guys are unavailable or up. And, I mean, this guy comes out and, uh, you know, puts up big-time numbers and just keeps on winning games. I mean, what an addition. I mean, credit to Zinger and uh, the guys who obviously found him. But, I mean, that's uh, that's another great story about this Moose season. It's it's remarkable. I, I really – it's just – I don't really have a whole lot to say other than the fact that it's just been phenomenal how he's come in and played the way that he has. He's single-handedly won us games um, in the month of January with some of the saves that he makes and, and him just keeping us in games and allowing us to try and maybe spin the momentum around if we don't necessarily have it in a game. And I mean, hats off to him. I, I just, he deserves to play in the American League. There's no other way to put it. Uh, it's uh, another great story of uh, one of many from the Manitoba Moose season so far. A couple games on the weekend, uh, 2 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. A little bit of a college schedule, and then you guys are going to get real busy, much like the Jets coming up in February. Um, it'll, be, it'll be interesting for the team to see how you guys are able to handle that because, you know, at times in the American Hockey League, it's just part of it, and you'd be used to it. You're getting used to it, especially earlier in the season playing on the weekends, practicing during the week. And then, I mean, just looking ahead at what is on your docket for the month of February, uh, guys better be ready. It's going to be a lot of hockey. Yeah, it's going to be busy, but you know what? That's, I think collectively as a group, that's what we would rather have. I mean, these, these be play Saturday, Sunday, have a week off in January and February. You don't want that as a player. You want to keep going. And especially right now with the momentum that we have as a team, you want to try and keep that going. You don't want to take your foot off the gas. So I think, you know, we're going to try and continue to play that way that we are here over the next couple of weekends and, and get through these weeks off. And I mean, take care of our bodies too. I mean, there's, there's the, there's the body management that comes into, into that as well and making sure that we're staying healthy and maybe taking care of a few bumps and bruises. But when the schedule's starting to get heavy, I think we're, we're looking forward to that. Nelson Noje, the Manitoba Moose is with us. Hey, Nelson, before we go, I mean, we were just chatting quickly off air uh, while Jerry Rice was on with us. I was asking if you were watching, you know, the National Football League. You said you weren't really for a long time, and then you caught the fantasy bug, and now you're all in. I'm all in, yeah. I mean, a lot of people listening to this probably don't want to hear this, but prior to being an NFL fan, and I still am, judge me as you may, I'm a, I'm a diehard Ryder fan too. 
Hey, you're from Saskatchewan. I, I mean, we would expect know, nothing less. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I mean, when we're at the lake in the summer times, so we've always got the rider game on. So, um, I mean, that that was my involvement in football until COVID, and then and then I got introduced to NFL fantasy football and just NFL football in general, and I have been hooked ever since. I've got a uh, a league back home with the buddies that I train with, and it allows us to kind of stay in touch throughout the season too. But there's a lot of chatter in there, and the group chat at all times, and it's uh, I spend a lot of hours on the Yahoo Fantasy app. <laughs> Who was the MVP of uh, the Nelson Noje squad this year, and how did the team do? The team finished second place. I was what was I thirteen and two going into the playoffs. That's pretty good. Thirteen and one, yeah, thirteen and one going into the playoffs. So I had a good year, lost in the final, so a little bit disappointing. But I uh, I worked the waiver wires real well. I had some guys that kind of pulled their weight when I needed them to, and I just couldn't pull through at the end. Well, there's always next year. Um, you know what? 28 teams in the in the league are thinking about that. Of course, we've got the uh, Niners and Rams and uh, Bengals and Chiefs on the weekend. It's going to be great. And uh, of course, uh, you guys will finish that game on Sunday afternoon and probably roll into the dressing room and uh, buckle up for what should be a great NFC Championship game. Listen, Nelson, this is a great conversation. Thanks so much to you. Uh, continued success to the Manitoba Moose. Been a great season so far, and uh, we'll be looking forward to following you guys and hopefully catching up again before the Calder Cup playoffs. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for your time, guys. Take care. Hey, appreciate it. You can follow him on Twitter at Nelson Noje. There's Nelson Noje of the Manitoba Moose. Uh, yeah, man, just a great conversation and, and really interesting to hear Nelson talk about, um, you know, as being a veteran leader with the moose um playing with these young guys and i mean that that those sort of answers that we heard from him, that's exactly what you want a veteran to sound like when you know some young guys are getting the opportunity to go up to the national hockey league i mean sometimes it probably can't be easy um you know knowing that you know there's younger guys that have been drafted higher that might be going up there but um what a member of the organization he's been spent a lot of time on the taxi squad um, and now doing a, a, a some real heavy lifting for the Moose right now through a tough point in the schedule without, you know, at any given time, maybe half their team that they started out with the beginning of the year. Big thanks to Dan Fink for helping us set that up. All right, let's get Remus back in here. Remo, we do need to uh, to recap the, uh, the visit that we had with Jerry Rice because, uh, I mean, we were, I don't want, well, I'll say it. We were borderline shaking getting him on the program today. This kind of, you know, came together last night. Again, a big thanks to Greg McIsaac for helping us make it up. But uh, it almost could not have gone any better. He was just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, uh, you know, we thought Steve Coolius had a lot of energy. And I mean, he sort of sets the bar. But Jerry had a ton for us, too. That was just an absolute all-time treat for us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Yeah, I had to like triple check that uh, I hit the record button. <laughs> um, thankfully, we pre-recorded. We almost had an issue where his microphone wasn't working, and I was able to uh, enable it. Thankfully, so some expert troubleshooting uh, at the beginning of the operation. I, I, we found out yesterday. I didn't want to tweet it out or anything until I'm like, I'm not believing this until <laughs> he's there. Uh, it was uh, pretty incredible. You know, it was a tough loss for the Jets, but we were really in a great mood uh, this morning having recorded that one, and we did pre-record the Steve Coolius interview, who brought a, a ton of energy. <laughs> but, but um, you know, this has been a great show uh, in total. I mean, Marat, uh, some great insight on the Jets and updates from their media today, but also Nelson Noje on the, um, on the, on the Moose and how they're doing Perfetti, the goaltending. Um, great, uh, great stuff. So it was, it was all a lot. This has been a fantastic show on... Um, an interesting day on social media. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that. Um, yeah, you know, you know, this has been one of our best shows ever. And um, you know what? Just to touch on that, I mean, obviously, we're not going to get into a bunch of the corporate hashtags and everything and that. I think people probably are pretty well aware how we feel about um, you know, the uh, the, the, that company. But I will say this: um, this conversation is important. And uh, no, listen, I appreciate a lot of people kind of throwing support our way by not really getting in and participating, if you will. Um, but the important thing coming out of all of this is to be there for your friends, loved ones, um, you know, be able to talk to them and be able to listen to them when they are having those issues. So, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're getting in on, you know, the hashtags and all those other things. 
Um, what's important right now is action. And, and of course, if you do want to make a donation, there's uh, a numerous um, yeah. fantastic organizations that do incredible work when it comes to mental health here in our community and across Canada. Um, and of course, last night was the Hockey Talks game. I mean, I can tell you that the Project 11 here in Manitoba is doing and has done some incredible work in the memory of Rick Rippon. So, um, you know what? Hey, we, we feel the support from all of you. And, um, you know, these next couple of weeks are going to be kind of weird because part of the reason why this whole big day is so muted this year is about what happened. And we, of course, were caught up in it uh, about a week and a half after uh, their big day. So um, I don't know. It'll be an interesting few weeks. But the bottom line is um, we've got smiles on our faces. We're doing our best. We've all had our challenges. And when things like that happen to anybody, but us included last year, I mean, you go through some tough days. Uh, but I'll tell you what, Remus, I got a big smile on my face. I'm feeling the love from everyone. And uh, uh, this is uh, this is a great day and a proud day for Winnipeg Sports Talk, um, both on the show and the support we're receiving from uh, the people that have been there for us really since, well, before March 8th when we started this program. We were hearing it for a month, and I think that was the biggest kick in the ass for both of us to get this going and just do it. Yeah, I, I agree. It comes, you know, coming in almost a year, and we'll probably be talking that more in a couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, feeling the love from everyone on social media and just, you know, if you want, I'll just point out, I mean, and you don't have to do a uh, hashtag or anything. If you do want to donate money directly to the Canadian Mental Health Association, you go to the website, cmha.ca, um, how you can help, ways to give. I'm just, if you're listening on the podcast, I'm just going through the website and number of areas you can donate monthly or in honor of a memory, number of things. So um, you don't have to go out and you know, make a tweet. There's a lot of other actions um, you can take. So um, appreciate all the support that we've seen, you know, since starting this. And, and I awesome coming here every day and, um, you know, seeing everyone in chat. I, I know I'm pretty active while you're doing the interviews, trying to keep it on, on track. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, it's, I, I agree. It's important to talk about, uh, what are you talking about, mental health. It's important to, you know, keep the conversation going, uh, especially not just today, but uh, every day as well. Yeah, and you know what? And I mean, uh, where was that? Mall Puri, shout out Mall. I mean, this show helps me love this community. Thanks, guys, for creating an amazing place to go and chat sports. And I really do appreciate that, Mall. I mean, I give you brain damage sometimes when I think your takes suck, and I do that to other people too. But that's sort of what it's all about. I mean, I think we are here. I mean, there's people that are creating friendships, whether they see people in real life or it's just here um, when we're live on YouTube, um, you know, doing the show live from one to three every day. Um, but I can tell you this, I mean, of course, we've started this throughout COVID and we've had all this BS to deal with and, you know, the rules and, 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 and serious problems. I mean, I, please don't take this the wrong way um, that, you know, diminishing what the, the, you know, the healthcare workers, I was just spent the morning in the hospital today. Um, you know, it's still there. I mean, it's still around and hopefully, um, you know, we'll be fingers crossed on the other end of this at some point soon. Um, but I will tell you the thing that I'm the most looking forward to as we get into year two of Winnipeg sports talk is being able to take this show on the road, um, whether we do things live. And I know a lot of people wouldn't be able to come out for that, but whether it's some jets and bomber watch parties, whether it's some other events, um, to bring people and be able to put names to the sometimes to faces to the sometimes ridiculous names in the chat and get people together. So um, that's certainly something that we're going to be working on. But, um, you know, for today, it's a tough day. I mean, uh, you know, I think for a lot of people too, um, you know, just being beaten over the head with this topic nonstop for 24 hours sometimes takes a toll on people. So bottom line is, if you need to reach out, um, do that. Do it to a friend, do it to a family member. Hell, do it to us. Um, you know, we're here right now. Our DMs are open. You know where we're at. Uh, and the bottom line is we're going to be here again tomorrow and we'll be there the next day and we'll be there the following Monday. Uh, and it's not stopping anytime soon. So uh, we do appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure we got to that. Hey, I, I wanted to leave it till the end as well, because I certainly didn't want to make all of this show today about what's going on on social media for the people that we used to work with or work for, I should say. Um, but as I said right now, this has been uh, been an amazing show today. We've just got smiles on our faces, and a big part of it is uh, thanks to you guys and the support that you've been giving us from uh, from the get go. Um, you know, hey, one other thing before we get to the cool bet lines, this is just to get back to sports after that little intermish. Um, 
Man, Remo, yesterday we were talking about Chapo pushing Rafael Nadal to a fifth set. And man, it happened again last night. Felix Oje Aliassime sort of in a reverse Chapo winning the first two sets. And then, I mean, Daniil Medvedev just too damn good on those big points late in the match. He comes back to win an incredibly tight marathon five setter. Um, and so a disappointing end for the in the quarters for both of our Canadians. Uh, but man, these are two young stars that are on the precipice of doing something real special. When you look, I mean, it's this sport has been dominated by Federer, by Djokovic, by Nadal for a long time. Joker, I mean, if he's still allowed to play in the big events, I don't know how that's going to work out this season. Um, still, you know, he's considerably younger than, than Federer or Nadal and, you know, will still be around for a while. Uh, but these two young guys are part of a young core of tennis stars between 21 and 22 to about 24 and 25. And this sport, um, especially for Canadian fans, is going to be incredibly thrilling to watch throughout this major season and really over the course of the next six, seven years. And that's not even beginning to talk about the incredibly bright future for Leila Annie Fernandez and hopefully Bianca Andreescu, who of course is a Grand Slam champion, but has had some real issues with injuries over the last couple of years. Who would have thunk it? Canadian tennis at this point. Yeah, I agree. I'm not a huge, um, just because the time change, I find the US, uh, sorry, the Australian Open a bit tough um, to get into. Although normally in past, like maybe I would have stayed up late for some of those, but I have enjoyed the runs of Canadian tennis over the last couple of years, you know, Raonic, Bouchard, but now to the new, you know, the new younger players, Chapeval, you said Felix. I mean, we haven't, hadn't, I didn't have this growing up. It's like, who's your favorite tennis player? And it's like, well, there's no one from Canada. So I'm going to pick, you know, Pete Sampras or Andre Agassi. And it's pretty cool. I mean, you see the ratings for Andrescu when she won the U S open and Layla and her run last year were, were very strong. So people are fired up when there's Canadians in. And I mean, we're seeing it in golf as well. I know a record number of Canadians in the tournament this weekend. So very, very exciting. And uh, we'll talk more about it tomorrow. John Horn um, messaged me. So uh, hell, come on. He can talk about um, Felix, but also Chapo getting into it with the, uh, with the official. Oh, uh, yeah. You're when, all corrupt. And you know what? He kind of had a point. I mean, it seems like there's sort of different rules for the legends of the game than uh, the young guys. And if I'm a young guy trying to take one of them out, I think I'd probably feel the same way. Uh, hey, let's get to the cool bet lines for today. And I see uh, Maul and a few guys mentioning big game tomorrow. The World Cup qualifying is back on and Canada is in Honduras to take on the Hondurans. Little unfinished business for our Canucks. Now, no Alfonso Davies. That, of course, is significant. But the one thing we've learned about this club is it's not just the old camp Team Canada with one worldwide superstar in Alfonso Davies. I mean, Jonathan David's right there, Tejon Buchanan. There's a number of incredibly bright young players that, you know, might have a little more pressure on their shoulders to get things done without Alfonso for these next three games, who, of course, is still dealing with some after effects of his bout with COVID. We certainly hope that AD gets back very soon on the pitch and will be uh, with Canada, hopefully in the World Cup, but there's work to be done. Starts tomorrow in Honduras. Canada is the favorite in the game, despite not having Davies, plus 108 for Canada. The draw is plus 225, and Honduras to win, uh, plus 285. So um, certainly the odds makers expecting Canada win. Uh, Canada, of course, playing USA on Sunday in Hamilton, they'll have, I believe, a half crowd or 12,000. Our boy Kubek Chris is going to be at the game. He, um, and Canada plus 200 to win, a draw plus 220, and the U.S. plus 145. Um, certainly will be a huge test. Uh, but a win tomorrow night, first and foremost for Canada, is what they need to maintain their spot in the top three and continue the uh, optimism that Canada will be back in the World Cup for the first time since 1986 and the first time in many of your lifetimes. Um, NHL tonight, what do we got? We got five games. Flames at the Blue Jackets. Flames a minus 200 favorite. Leafs land minus 278 at home against the Anaheim Ducks. Caps a big minus 217 home favorite against the Sharks. Uh, a slight favorite, Detroit at home, minus 116 against the Blackhawks in two teams on uh, the wrong end of the playoff line. And then the Boston Bruins and the Colorado Avalanche. It should be actually be a real good game. That's a late one tonight. Nine o'clock start. Avs minus 185. 
Bruins plus 155. And just quickly, let's do a quick look and see if uh, there's been any change with the lines for the NFL playoff games on the weekend. Early game, Arrowhead, 2 p.m. Bengals still seven-point underdogs against the Kansas City Chiefs. And right now, I mean, this line is staying at three and a half, although the uh, you're laying minus 120 for the 49ers if you want to take the points. And if you like the Rams to cover the three and a half and win by four, you're getting more than plus money on that. So uh, uh, it's all there at Cool Bet right now. And uh, I'll probably touch on this on the lock shop on Friday, but one of my favorite events of the year, the Royal Rumble is out. And that's the one event that you can usually bet on Cool bets just put the lines out for the Royal Rumble. So we'll have some fun with that on the lock you, shop. You did a little uh, bit later you did on. correctly pick the winner last year. You should point did, that out. I did give out edge at eight to one. Uh, and uh, the number craters, we got closer to it. But if you got on it early, it was there. So I'll be doing some intensive WWE handicapping over the next couple of days. And on Friday's lock shop, we'll uh, give you a few picks for the uh, Royal Rumble. And as I mentioned, Remo, I mean, under normal times, if traveling was a lot easier, I have a feeling I would probably be in St. Louis on Saturday. I mean, looking at that day, Jets Blues Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m., maybe pop by Bobby Plager's place for a couple cold ones and then walk down to the Dome for the Royal Rumble. That's not that, literally that is the, a, almost a perfect day for me. Two of my favorite events, seeing the Jets on the road. And uh, as I said, now that I am a veteran of a Royal Rumble, uh, that's something that I would definitely be into. It's uh, kind of a one of a kind, once a year event that is, it's really, really fun, even if you're a very casual fan. Is it on a Saturday now? It, well, it's on a Saturday this year because the because Sunday is championship. Oh. Like the NFL schedule moved back a year. Like when I went to it in Houston, it was the weekend in between the conference championship games yes. and the Super Bowl. And that's the way it had been. But with the added week, I don't know whether they just didn't decide to put it off a week or what, but I think they realized the last thing we want to do is be putting up any event up against the National Football League playoffs, especially the championship games and the conferences. Um, so it's going to be Saturday. And that's been a bit more of a change. So yeah, Saturday night, Royal Rumble. We'll hit it on the lock I shop. And uh, Jets in St. Louis Saturday afternoon. Well, I'm really hoping that Jeff Hamilton goes. I never got why WWE always did their pay-per-views on a Sunday for years. I think they're going more over to Saturday. Like they had the big one in Vegas before. Wasn't that on a on a Saturday as well? I know yep. we're getting there's been into... a There's definitely there's been a couple this year. And uh, now, I mean, I don't know if WrestleMania is a two-day event going forward, but uh, it sort of seems like that uh, that, that is it right now. Right. Oh, Hey, while we're at it, just quickly, I've still got it up. Uh, here, you're, uh, if you want to get a future right now for the National Football League, Chiefs to win the Super Bowl, plus 125. Rams to win the Super Bowl, 2-1, to one, plus 200. The Niners, plus 450. And man, Joe Burrow, I mean, uh, I don't know if Winnipeg Walter's in here. He's been pumping the tires of the Bengals for a long time. And hey, well, why wouldn't you? What a season they've had and a couple of massive wins. 9-1 to one on the Bengals. But that means going in and beating my guy Mahomes on the weekend. Don't think that's going to happen, but uh, hey, they got an opportunity and it should be a great game. So 2 p.m. and 5.30 p.m. AFC, NFC Championship games. We'll break it all down on Monday's program. Um, tonight, Remo, five games in the league, but uh, I guess uh, we'll just get ready for a big show tomorrow. And man, I'm looking forward to it. Mike McIntyre is going to set up tomorrow night's game and give us the latest from the morning skate. Uh, but we're also going to have Mike Kelly come back in the program. And Mike, if anyone has been watching this program or listening to us beforehand, uh, for my money, one of the best young minds in hockey. Uh, we had Cooley on today, and it'll be great to back that up with Mike Kelly tomorrow and get his thoughts on what's happening with our local side. For sure. And before we go, as I mentioned before, actually, John Horn, too, on the tennis. But before we go, we've got to touch on a couple things quickly. And we're running out of time. Baseball Hall of Fame yesterday. David Ortiz, the only one getting in. Um, Bonds, Clemens, not they're in. Um, they're off the ballot. Now, they'll probably go to like the Veterans Committee and get vo voted in, but I mean, they should be in. They're Hall of Famers. I mean, their stats are in the record books. Um, you know, it's, they kind of put the baseball writers in a tough spot where they have to be the moral compass on MLB. Baseball celebrated these guys' accomplishments when they happened. They happened. Um, they should be, they should be in. I, you know, yeah. there's not too many people that feel otherwise. 
Um, and if you want to say, I mean, on their plaque, you want to make a mention of, you know, what had happened over the course of that. I mean, baseball was revitalized by that home run race. Mm-hmm. Um, and then these guys are vilified. And the biggest irony of the entire thing is everyone knows that Big Pappy was in on it as well. And somehow he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. I mean, there's a lot of people like Barry Bonds was a jerk. Roger Clemens was an a-hole to a ton of the guys that covered the game. But just because a guy was a jerk is not a reason to keep him out. And if you're keeping those guys out, I don't know how big Pappy's going in on the first ballot. It it seems a little bit hypocritical. And, and you know, I, I listened to a lot of reaction yesterday from a lot of people that I respect. Um, and I do have to say, I think these decisions is going to seriously diminish the Hall of Fame in the minds of many baseball fans. And that's going to be something that they're going to need to to deal with or rectify because... I mean, Barry Bonds is arguably the greatest player that ever played. There was a stretch of his career, Remo, where his at-bats resulted in a home run or a walk 39% of the time. I saw last night a video of him getting walked with the bases loaded. I mean, nobody did what Barry Bonds did. And, And he would have been a Hall of Famer even if he never started on whatever he was taking and doubled his head in size. I mean, literally from what he did with the Pirates to his early times with the Giants was Hall of Fame worthy. So, um, you know, it's very, very controversial. Um, And listen, I'm not a big fan of Roger Clemens, but I think we can all agree, um, you know, one of the greatest pitchers ever. And um, listen, everyone seemed to be doing it right now. Major League Baseball turned a blind eye to it for so long. And now to keep these guys out of the hall seems very sanctimonious. But frankly, there's a lot of sanctimonious dudes that have a vote. Yes, uh, I'm going to, and one one last thing, Aaron Dell took out uh, Drake Batherson being the Royal Rumble. I would call that a clothesline. Cheap uh, shot. Big, cheap uh, shot. T- 10 games. He should be gone 10 games hitting a defenseless player. Come on, lay the smack down. I know we want to. He's wanna, done this before. He's, he's done said, it be- He did this to Mark Stone a few years ago. And, um, you know, it was, it was again, yeah. it was cheap. But what do you think he'll get? Let's make more, some predictions more importantly, right now. I had Drake Batherson on DraftKings and he <laughs> scored a goal. And couldn't get any more, and Buffalo put up more goals, and I, I cost me money. So Aaron Dell, I think he'll probably get like he should. I think he should get five games. I think they'll probably give him three. I mean, he yeah. injured the guy. The Two guy can't three. go to the go to the All Star game now. He's gonna sprained what a sprained knee or something. He's out for a bit. Like stupid, like garbage play. You can't the touch. Called it greasy. There's not a lot of people that are backing up uh, Aaron Dell today. So uh, uh, listen, I, I hope they make a. I hope they make an example out of him. They certainly didn't mind doing it with Mark Scheifele in the playoffs last year. It can't be too hard to suspend a goalie from the freaking San Jose Sharks to make a statement. So uh, maybe they go and do that. In fact, I'll take the over on two and a half games. I think three, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was four or five, especially because he's done this in the past. And I'll tell you what, he deserves it. Yes. Yeah, that's, it's sick that goalies can do that. Oh, don't touch a goalie. You can't touch a goalie. And then he's going laying. What? Uh, it's like when, like, Rick Flair used to slap guys in the chest and they'd like go flying into the, into the ropes. So, uh, sick that he would do that and cost me money in fantasy. Remo's Disgusting. Got a, he's got a seed to feed. You can't be yeah. taking money out of his kid's mouth. I'm trying, yeah, shot. I'm trying to get to the top of these, uh, contests here and I can't do it when guys get injured. Come on. <laughs> uh, holy smokes, folks. What a great show today. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, we've got, oh, geez, we've gone quite long, but Hey, yeah. you know what? If there was ever a show to go long, it was a day where we had Jerry Rice join us, not to mention some incredible heat from Steve Coolius. If you pop by late and didn't see the beginning of the program, uh, definitely check out Cooley, check out Marat and definitely the goat Jerry Rice. And thanks again to Nelson Noje for coming on. Really enjoyed that conversation. Um, thanks to DraftKings and the folks that helped us line up Jerry Rice and a big thanks to all of our sponsors, the Nick and Nikki DQ group, Canadian club, whiskey, little Brown jug, princess auto, Boston pizza, cool bet, Canada, Donnie and the guys powering the city at Manitoba battery, Royal sports, not auto corp, F apparel, Vita health. And of course our friends at Culligan water folks, that's going to do it for Winnipeg sports talk today. We'll be back tomorrow. Mike and Mike, Mike Kelly from NHL Network, Mike McIntyre from the Winnipeg Free Press, and we'll get you ready for the Jets and Vancouver Canucks, as well as a little Aussie Open aftermath with John Horn. Thanks so much for all the support, everyone. Have a great night, and we'll see you tomorrow on WST. Oh, my God! Shut it down! Let's go home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. 
Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.